The price of freedom coming to get our check. Black first, my brothers and sisters, welcome to the Afro Elite YouTube channel. I am your host, Afro Elite. Before we get started with a very, very special broadcast, we have special guests here. Please make sure you guys hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, leave a thumbs up and share this on your various social media platforms because that helps the reach and growth of the channel. Uh, we were just on like a few seconds ago with our Dr. Randy Short, and we're back on again with Dr. Randy Short. Now we're going to be talking about the American Maroon documentary by our brother Tariq Nasheed. So without any further ado, let me introduce our guests, our two guests, Dr. Randy Short and Dr. Winters. Okay, so welcome, Dr. Randy Short, and welcome, Dr. Winters. How are you all doing? Fine, thank you. Hey, Elder, how you doing? You got it. I like those glasses, man. They look powerful, I'm making me ready to go fight, baby. Yeah, well, we're yeah. I just finished talking. In I fact, um, we need to do a black power and black leadership conversation with Brother uh, Afro Elite, and I want to have Larry Pinkney so we can sit in and talk about no good because you're not talking about those sorry ass NAACP people. You know they're no damn good, and you, you, it, it's just important that. So anyway, but we're going to talk about this American maroon thing. That's so, right. and uh, yes. I'm, I'm very happy, Afro Elite, that you allowed me to to be on this uh, program with me the superstar, too. with the superstar, because he is he is the star of America. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, well, first off, I want to thank you for being here with us. It's, uh, it's an honor for me to have you here. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Short, for being here. Um, I want to say I saw American Maroon at the History uh, Hidden History Museum. Wow. Uh, the of it. It was amazing. Everybody loved it, especially your scenes. Eh, no, no diss, no shade to nobody else, but especially your scenes. I feel like most of the people were very interactive. They laughed. They clapped. They um, really enjoyed much of what you said in the film. So uh, I want to ask you, what was your experience kind of, you know, being asked first off and then filming, being on on scene? How was, how was that like for you? Well, um, <laughs> Tariq Nasheed is a lot of fun to work with. He's a lot. He's just a good, you get a good vibe from Tariq. He's, he's easy to work with. His people are professional. Um... And unlike a lot of people that I've done, I've done, I've done hundreds and hundreds of interviews. Um, Tariq is one of the easiest, most considered people to work with. And um, I'm just speaking from experience. He's, he's wonderful to work with. He knows what he wants. And, uh, and what's interesting is, is that if you introduce something he hadn't thought of, He'll put it in there. He'll take the time to add it. So he's he's great to work with. He he's like a sponge. He's constantly soaking up and taking in everything he can to understand the narrative better than what he knew hitherto and to present that to other people. You know, he's like talking to Tariq as like being a, a kindergarten teacher. And I say that in the sense that when you work with kids, when they're very, very young, they're so smart. They're just taking everything, you know, that's why you can't say cuss words around kids. They'll learn those. I mean, the first time he said, they'll never forget it. I remember the one time I was around my uh, cousin and we said pussy just one time. And she could tell that was something that, and she said that thing for hours. And we just prayed that she'd stop because we were all going to get beat when her mom got home. <laughs> Yes, kids are that smart. Tariq is like that. Once he gets something, he's got it, and he's going to tell everybody. Mm. And that's what makes him special. He's not trying to just be a heavy nigger by himself. He wants other people to know what he's learning. And and knowledge is, is like sex. It's best when it's shared. Well, between two people. <laughs> between two people, okay? Okay, you know, got to keep it holy. Jesus, white Jesus, white Jesus, help me. You know, I meant, you know, I meant two people. I didn't mean groups. So I, I just finished trashing the boule. Yeah, the other no, thing yeah. is, it was really, really nice. Uh, 
Tariq literally had me flown down to uh, Savannah, Georgia, which is one of the places that I have family going back like 250 years. So it was really uh, great to be there and uh, put you up uh, and just, you know, I know other folks, they want you to go broke for them to get a production and get paid off of it. And he was quite considerate in that. So it was good. And uh, every now and then, Tariq will ask you a question. People need to understand, when you're like Dr. Winters, we've been reading and looking at stuff so long, sometimes you forget details. And, and you know, people think, you know, well, I can't remember all the stuff the other day I was doing an interview with with uh, with you, Dr. Winters, and I couldn't remember Percy Sledge's name to save my life. And I know Percy Sledge. I could start the song he sang, Take Time to Get to Know Her. I know all of that and couldn't get the brother's name because I haven't even had to think about him since he died in 2015. So sometimes Tariq will ask you a question. You haven't even thought about something and 15, 16, so, because I'll be honest with you, a lot of bright people like myself, Dr. Winters, we don't even get to really talk about what we know to people. It, it's, it's, and this is part of how they've been destroying us as a people, as you isolate brilliant people because we're like rotten apples that will spoil everybody else. So what we learn is kept away. They don't... Dr. Winter should be paid a quarter of a million dollars a year at an elite school and does two lectures a week. And yes, but that's not what's happened because they don't want our information out. So someone like me, I have books in storage by the thousands. I used to have documentaries and such. They, you weren't allowed to share it. They've been stifling your ability because our information is subversive to the system. So as a result, uh, a lot of folks, you, you wouldn't believe it, but a lot of black intellectuals and all, they drink or they commit suicide because they give up because they're not allowed to do. You know, when we see uh, Whitney Houston, who couldn't sing the way she wanted to, or certain musicians, uh, Phyllis Hyman committed suicide, they couldn't do. You have people who are very brilliant in our community that are not able not even with the no good HBC screws. Even little black schools don't let you teach or share or impart knowledge, and that's your, your, your passion. They effectively kill and destroy people. If you ever talk to people in a lot of these uh, colleges, uh, a lot of the people have cancer because they're miserable. Very brilliant people who have a lot to offer who are not allowed to offer it's a way to kill us off. And that's one thing I also say I like about Tariq. He's an outlet for Dr. Winters and others, people who are reading, who are learning this stuff. And I'll just be honest, they make it hard for you to get it out there. So that's a beautiful thing. He's like the information highway for alternative black information. And we need to say Ashe and love to Tariq Nasheed. Asheo, Asheo. Absolutely. Shout out to our brother Tariq Nasheed. I mean, everything uh, I've met him a couple times personally, and I, I can say I've met him when there is no cameras around. There's no people around. He's you a know. cool brother. He's yeah, a cool, he's, he's a beautiful he's a, human being. Solid, solid brother, man, through and through, you know, so shout out to Tariq. Uh, I want to ask you about the um, American Maroon film. Uh, now, as I I, um, I know for a fact that you knew of the American Maroons and of the history, but is there anything in particular you might have learned through the process of filming the documentary? Who who are you asking me or the elder? Um, it, it, it was directed towards you, but the uh, Doctor okay. Winters, you he, can he probably it. knows it all. For me, okay. I'm not as smart as he is. Okay. I, it, that's why I don't like being called an elder. Okay. Um. I was really impressed by the people that did brought the, the, the elements of the Moorish history, uh, things that I hadn't done. I'll tell you, there's some areas in history, like the Civil War, 
uh, the teachers that I had in the universities and all, a lot of them were racist that were in particular areas, Arab America and the Civil War. And so I tended to avoid that because I didn't want to be in a, a, a classroom situation or teaching situation with people who hate black folks' guts. Because when you get into history, you'll find uh, the history profession is the most racist profession in the country. Mm. Am I right, Dr. Winters? You're right. It's, it's the most racist. It's because it's basically it's white people's uh, Fort Knox of lies and you're nigging there with the, with, with the lockpick. They don't want you there. And so I learned about the explorers. I didn't like a lot of the stuff. And by the way, I got into trouble at the very beginning of my academic career at Howard University for embarrassing um, David Brian Davis. I know you know who I'm talking about, Dr. Winters. David Brian Davis. I never met him, but go ahead. You know who I'm talking about. You know, I made him look like a fool at Howard University. And after that, the people in the history department hated me because they brought in this white man who didn't understand black history. And I embarrassed him as a teenager in the history department at Howard. And I got on the enemies list. Uh, and so I learned from that. You can you can have a, a degree of inquiry or command of knowledge of stuff that's not in the official canon. And people decide to destroy you for bringing up certain topics, in particular, if you have a white or a black instructor that thinks that they're special because they went to Princeton or some other place. And so um, and I, I did black diaspora as an undergraduate at Howard. And you had to be careful because a lot of people hated what we were learning. In fact, black diaspora was at one point uh, seen as dangerous. Uh, when I was taken, they didn't like that. Black diaspora was bad. So certain things I didn't do. And if you were in a black diaspora uh, uh, program, the white teachers were very difficult, even at Howard. And so I, I neglected certain areas. I tended to move towards modern, more recent history and stay away from certain things uh, because, you know, there are other things I knew. I grew up with a book on American history, a series on all the states. And I knew when I was in the first grade that black people were in America in 1525, 1524. I knew this. So the 1619 thing, I, before I, I literally, when I got to school, I knew I spent the first from uh, pre-kindergarten all the way until I was in the uh, fourth grade. I was a discipline problem because I would always counter the teachers in classes. And uh, I'm certain somewhere in Fairfax County, they've got a file this thick of people saying I was retarded. I was disruptive. I was criminally insane as a kid. Are you understanding me? So yes, they uh, probably threw it away by now. No, no, they keep it archived. Mm -hmm. Actually, they do. They keep the, the record. No, you, can't. you can't keep them at eighth grade. Once you oh. leave elementary school, we had to throw that stuff away. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah. it may be different. I'm down south now. <laughs> and so I know, I ha I remember seeing the notes where the teachers said that I was ignorant, I was stupid, I was dangerous. And these are the notes that would come home. So I sort of didn't, having experienced that at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. When I had the bad experience at Howard, I recognized that you didn't have free inquiry, uh, even in the university. So I didn't. And I learned. Let me tell you, I, I have a Ph.D. from Howard. Do you realize you can't graduate from certain programs at Howard if you cite Dr. Winter's works in your in your papers? They will fail you. We were told our first week, first two weeks in the African Studies Department. If you put anything Afrocentric or whatever, you're not. We 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 won't have you. So I left the Morris. I did just stayed away from it to avoid yeah. even even bringing it up to avoid getting destroyed in my program. Did any uh, did anything change when uh, Greg Carr got there? No. Can you Greg, put Afrocentric stuff in the uh, your papers? You, he, hold on. The 
Black Studies Department at Howard University is run by the Anti-Defamation League, which is a Jewish organization. They control the uh, Africana Studies Department at Howard. I thought Greg Carr was the uh, was the uh, chairman. He 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 I, he's no longer the chair. There's someone else now. But the ADL was given control of the Africana Studies Department after there was a whole bunch of stuff by Malik Zulu Shabazz and others denouncing Jews back in the uh, middle 90s. Oh, wow. Can I, can I, um, Dr. Winters, is it possible you can lower the camera a little bit so uh, they can have like a better? They, they, okay, yeah, that's much, much better. The people, the people, they know how I look. They know <laughs> how I look. Yeah. They see me every week. They know how I look. Yes. They know so that I am, might get too close to the camera. Am I answering your question, at Brother Afro Elite? Yes. So uh, I stayed away question. from the Moors and Afrocentric type stuff, which would get you destroyed. I almost got thrown out of Harvard for writing a paper citing uh, certain things. So you sometimes you stay away from stuff mm -hmm. to get through the programs. What you need to understand is there's no such thing as academic freedom for black people. Absolutely. And particular black men. Absolutely. And so I literally almost didn't get to graduate from Harvard for saying that black people that were enslaved felt that the white people that sold, beat them, raped them and killed them were not Christians in the same way they were. And that was enough for someone to pull three years of work. One sentence. Wow. Mm. Yeah, a lot, of people don't know, a lot of people don't know academia, you know. It's 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 so um I felt very, very blessed to be a part of this this project and to see what these people learned. I know they didn't learn it in school. They were motivated to know the truth. And so outside of the academy, they were able to bring all of this truth and knowledge in a format that was digestible, that people could see, because a lot of folks won't read. When you go to the library and you see a lot of black folks, they're homeless people or folks looking for sex. They're rarely reading. I'm talking about the Martin Luther King Library. That's the place where they have the hole in the stall so you can turn into the glory hole. <laughs> oh, it, they're wow. not there reading. You know, I'm going to tell you something. I, I love libraries, but I tell you, you know, I was afraid, you know, I wouldn't drink or eat so I didn't have to uh, urinate or go to the bathroom because, you know, folk would jump you. Yeah. We don't go. We're not reading. We, we need to read more as the people. So I was so happy to see that these people are reading and imparting information and stuff I didn't know. I knew about blacks being in Spain. I know about the folks going into Ceuta. I, I, I know that I, I'm familiar with El Cid and all of that. But I and I knew there were black folks on the boats, but I didn't know black folks owned the boats. I knew about some, I mean, so they took it to a level way beyond what would have been offered to me in a university class setting. And that was really, I was rocked by that. And I want to say to Dr. Winters, if you know the books from that documentary, and I even wrote Tariq, they need to send that to me because I'm going to buy a few copies. That's why I'm always begging for Cash App. Send me money so I can have these books so I know. That's what I was so, 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 so impressed by. The, um, and first, thank you both for being here once again. I, there are some questions for you, Dr. Shore. But before we get to that, I want to ask Dr. Dr. Winters um, a couple of questions. And then we can um, get to, you know, the because I'm sure a lot of the people who are listening right now they have some questions but real fast dr winners you've seen the american maroon film right yeah i i, I had to go see it because i was in it let me tell you <laughs> how i got in it um i uh i do a i do a weekly program for the last two years with reverend matthew so we have about seven thousand people that listen to us every week but the thing is this is that my uh because of the fact that i'm the i don't like to brag but since i'm the only expert on Aboriginal Black, uh, Aboriginal Foundational Black Americans, people who are uh, people, the family that listen to our program every week, they contacted, uh, they contacted Tariq, and uh, they told Tariq that he that he should maybe put me in his movie, and uh, so Tariq he contacted me, he flew me out to uh, L.A. 
I didn't I didn't get a chance to stay in a nice hotel, but uh because they wouldn't let you they wouldn't let you stay in hotels if you were on uh if you were on uh inoculated. But I met uh, I met mm-hmm. Tariq and uh you know after Tariq had flew me out, I got a chance to meet his beautiful wife and we talked and uh you know, just like Dr. Short said, and as you said, uh anybody that anybody that knows Tariq Nasheed will tell you that he's he's the same everywhere we go. And so then the thing is this is that I, I had uh, I had liked the fact that a lot of people, like even Kava, you know, Kava, he always talks a lot about my work. In fact, in fact, much of the uh, much of the stuff in the Marine in the uh, in the American Maroons came from my book. We are not just Africans, mm. because he, I'm the one who I'm the one who've done the research to show that these Aboriginal Black people had a history. Kava, Kava has Indian ancestry, also uh, Smalls. But the point is, this is that although they had, although they have an Aboriginal FBA ancestry, they didn't know the history. What I've done over the past uh, ten years is I've researched and wrote about it, and discussed our beautiful history as Aboriginal Black Americans. Because see, the thing that makes the thing that makes the research so important, and what what makes Reverend, I mean, uh, Dr. Short so instrumental, is that Dr. Short, his family in a sense come from the Carolinas and from the Virginias. And so when you know the history of Aboriginal Black Americans, you know, foundational Black Americans, you know that it was in Virginia where the first, uh, the first, you know, uh, leagues, the first confederation. See, Black people organized in confederations. And see, as we discussed, as we discussed in American Maroon, because of the fact that these Black people, we were the original Indian, Indians. That's why they called them copper color. But see, mm. the point is this is that although they called us copper color, what happened is, is that a lot of mongoloid Indians. See, remember, remember, you see all these Chicanos and these Mexicans talking about they have a, a strong ancestry in the United States. That's a lie. If you look at the 1860 census, you will find that there was only 4,000 Spanish speaking people in the whole United States. That's from California all the way up into Maine. 4,000. That means that the rest of those people are immigrants. But see, what happened is this. A lot of mongoloid people came up with their raggedy asses. They didn't have shit. They uh, came in their teepees because they were nomadic people. They ca- they came to the East Coast and they met the five civilized tribes because the original five civilized tribes, Cree, Seminole, Cherokee, these were all black people, black people, just like mm-hmm. you and I. What happened in a sense is that 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 many of many of the early colonists they didn't bring women. So Frederick, I mean, not Frederick Douglass, but Benjamin Franklin said, aha, what we have to do is, is that we have to marry these mongoloid women. And so they they said that using mongoloid women and mongoloids, they can rule the world. And that's one of the reasons why, that's one of the reasons why, in a sense, you have many of these so-called white Indians that mm. control, especially out in Oklahoma. But the fact is, is that the Aboriginal Black Americans, they were the first slaves. Let me tell you the history of chattel slavery. See, we've been taught a lie. The first slaves in America were that the first people made, to be made slaves in America were Aboriginal foundational Black Americans. And mm. they were made chattel slaves in 1624. But mm. Oliver Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell in Britain, let me explain to you. Ireland, Wales, and Scotland was occupied by Black people. Can you believe that? Wow. That's a for you. Scotland and Wales was occupied by black people. And you have to tell them about Scotia. Oh, yeah, like that that was the uh, Queen Scotia from the the Egyptians. But but anyway, Oliver Cromwell, he was he was an uh, he was a Protestant. The black the black people who lived in Ireland and the black people who lived in Scotland and the black people who lived in Wales, they were Catholics. And what Oliver Oliver Cromwell did is he came in. And he killed over a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand mm-hmm. of these black Irishmen and these black Welch and these black Scotsmen. They took the black babies and threw them in down in the fire and burned them up. But mm. between between 1654, between 1654 and 1659, Oliver Cromwell sent two hundred thousand black Irishmen over to America, not as indentured servants. He sent them over as chattel slaves. So the first slaves that came into America, the first chattel slaves were what? 
Aboriginal Foundation of Black Americans. The second Aboriginal slaves were Black Irishmen and Scotsmen, you see? And then the third the third people to be made, made Foundation of Black Americans were Sub-Saharan Africans. But Sub-Saharan -Sub Africans, when they came over in 1619, remember, they were indentured servants. It was only after this guy named Anderson wanted to wanted to keep his wanted to keep his indentured servant, a black man a slave, that we see in a sense that that chattel slavery for Africans began in 1669. Right. Is that John Punch? Um no, it was Anderson. Guy but called well, Anderson. but he wasn't was, John Punch wasn't John Punch the slave? Um uh, I think so. I think he had a different name. But what okay. happened is that he uh he had won the first case. But then, uh, then Anderson was able to take him back to court. And what they did in the sense is that this is when chattel slavery began. And so see, black people, foundation of black Americans have a tripartite, a tripartite origin in the sense that we're from the Aboriginal FBA. Then we're from the black Irishmen who were chattel slaves. They worked on the same plantations as black Indians. And later the Africans came and they were forced under these plantations. Well, this guy is named John Punch. His name was John Punch, yeah. John you know, Punch is, is the person that um, had to be a slave the remainder of his life. He was in uh, Virginia. Yeah. He escaped to state. Maryland. He escaped to Maryland. And um, by the way, they're saying that he's related to Barack Obama's mama. He could <laughs> be. But you see, know what? You got to remember that uh, Barack Obama's mama is a Huguenot, and most of the Huguenots were black people that came from, uh, you know, Norway and France. So uh, m many of the Huguenots, just like most of the Sephardic Jews, most of the Sephardic Jews that came to the United States originally were black Jews. I know it's hard to believe, but no, it's not hard. It's not hard to believe the way I'm having this issue. With twenty three and me, I, well, I really tell, do believe you. Tell the people what happened to you at twenty three. Oh yeah, well you know I did a test with uh, my heritage DNA and it linked me up to be at least three and a half percent Oriental or Sephardic Jew. When I went to twenty three and me, two times they said they couldn't isolate my DNA, and they uh, told me that they would refund me fully. But uh, if I submitted another a DNA test, they wouldn't refund me. In other words, we, we don't want your money. We don't want your business. And see, they, they didn't want it because, see, remember, uh, I don't know if you understand Afro Elite, but usually when, when, they, when, 20, when they do your, your uh, DNA, they connect you to your relatives. Mm. And, when, and when, they, when they probably ran it off and found out that, uh, that Dr. Short, Randy, was related to uh, was related to Goose Guzman or, or Freeberg. They didn't want that to come out. See, the yeah. other thing is that you've been taught a lie, man. You've been taught a lie. The Sephardic Jews, they were, remember the Sephardic Jews, they had been in Spain. And because they had been in Spain, they were part of the Moorish Empire. And just like the Moors were black, the Sephardic Jews were black also. What's... Uh, I want to say something that you just taught me recently about the Irish people coming over here and them being black, because a lot of people, when we say about how us as foundational black Americans, we were the slaves that built the country. A lot of people in white society say, well, Irish were slaves, too. But we're learning here today that the Irish that they say were slaves were actually black people. Yeah, so there was nobody people. in this country who was a slave and who wasn't black. Only black people were slaves, he ain't, and, even including the Irish, who were indentured servants. And there is a no, book no, no, by, no, no, no. by Noel Ignatieff called How the Irish Became White. There are a lot of people that weren't white. The Italians weren't white or the Greeks or the Germans. weren't white when they first got here. A range of people. The Whiteness Germans. is a conditional uh situational identity it's usually they need people to be in opposition to the original inhabitants of this land which is us that's what makes them white is that they aren't who we are you have, you mm. have to understand you have to understand afros that many of the germans were black i know that one of the greatest actors in america his name is arnold schwarzenegger 
Swartz mm-hmm. mean black, Niger mean nigga. Arnold, black nigga. What I'm saying is this is that so many, so many Germans were also black. The Vikings were black, but that's another story. None of none of them, none of them came over as chattel slaves. What mm-hmm. you have to understand is this is that that the European has to tell you a lie so he can create a history for himself. You know, haven't you haven't you ever wondered in a sense? Haven't you ever wondered why why black people in a sense are so are so militant? Have you ever wondered why black people see themselves as prisoners of war? The black Irish, they were they were prisoners of war captured by, you know, Oliver Cromwell, the 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 various black tribes. I'm a uh, my uh, my mother's side. I'm Choctaw. Uh, Miss uh, Reverend uh, Randy Randy. He's got he's got two or three African. I mean, uh, uh, Aboriginal origins. But then my father, he was a slave of the Vientors. The Vientors. You see, mm. and so they came together. But the point is this is that because of the fact that they had black Irishmen, they had black Indians, and they had sub-Saharan Africans all on the same plantations. The same plantations. See, this is very important. You see, I was talking to uh to uh Dr. Short the other day. That's why black people favor so many black people in other parts of the country. Let me explain to you. As part of the constitution. They outlawed the uh, Atlantic slave trade. When they outlawed the Atlantic slave trade, they began what was called the interstate slave trade in 1800. And what they what they would do is that they took slaves from Maryland, Connecticut, Kentucky, West Virginia. They took slaves in a sense, and they began to sell them to the deep south, Mississippi, Arkansas. But in places like Kentucky and Maryland, these became slave breeding states. And in these slave breeding mm-hmm. states, a slave mom might have maybe 10 or 12 kids. Or That's 20. Cool. Huh? They would get their freedom if they had 20. Right. And, and then wow. you know, having, baby, having babies that often, most of them really died. Because, you mm-hmm. know, when you keep having babies um, successively, it's difficult. But what happened is that, now think about this. The average slave during, during the interstate slave trade was sold at the age of five years old. So when you when you think that a sister had about ten babies, one baby sold in Mississippi, one baby sold one baby sold to Arkansas, one baby sold to Alabama. We don't know where the hell our relatives are. The only man, the only man in the history of America that can find out where they went was Doctor Shore. Oh, oh no, I don't know where. I know it's. I know where some are. I, 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 you find them all over the place if you know what to look for. If you, yeah. in fact, this is a big thing that I hope comes out of American Maroon, is for us to understand that we're one large family. Yes. And mm-hmm. and it doesn't. It's not always what your last name is. I have a buddy. We were on the phone, uh, Doctor Winners, and this man I met who's an activist. I saw him for the first time over Zoom. It blew my mind looking at him. It was freaking me out looking at him because I'd never seen this man before. And he's a doppelganger for my grandfather. Wow, wow. And today I sent him a picture of my grandfather as a young man and he had to laugh and say, this exactly looks like me. Yeah. If he showed his mother, his mother would say, when did you take that picture? <laughs> looking at our own son. He looks so much like my grandfather. He's now questioning whether we are uh, our, 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 our first cousins because he looks exactly like my grandfather. And there's a place down in North Carolina where people used to go to be freaky called Little Egypt. And his family used to go down there. My grandfather used to go down there. There's a possibility... <laughs> uh, little Egypt. I don't know where it is. I just know they went at some place. The folk went to get down. Uh, Freak Nick isn't new. Uh oh. You know, and like, and, you know, and so very- my grandfather would go down to Little Egypt, and that man's grandmother used to go to Little Egypt. Maybe his grandmother, and my grandfather, got together, and therefore he could be my first cousin. And I met him just by virtue that his company. I uh, told the car that was in my mother's handicapped space. That's 
Do you get where I'm coming from? Oh, yeah. And 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 I know uh, a cat that called me that that knows me through social media that lives in in Washington State. I didn't know through the screen name, but when he told me his last name, I knew where he was from. We we need to understand that we we need to to like the maroon the maroon communities did something that we didn't mention in the film. The maroon communities allowed people to establish families that could not be broken up easily. Yeah. That was one of the appeals of being a maroon is that you couldn't take my woman or my children or my man, or we might fight to death. We'll all die together. A lot of people scream and talk about Masada for Jews in Israel, but they don't see Fort Mose as Black America's Masada. That we'll go down together, father, mother, kids, children, grandparents. We'd rather die than be your slaves. And see, and see, that's very important, Afro elite. Is that it's very important to understand that that people, the government hates the government hates the whole idea of us calling ourselves foundational Black Americans. Let me explain to you. the The white man took over the world, took over Africa. He took over, in a sense, uh, uh, America because we were organized in the tribes, you know. In Africa, we were organized in the tribes. And what, and what the white man did is that he allowed us, in a sense, to kill each other off and sell, and sell our brothers and sisters into slavery because we didn't see them as brother and sister. Mm. If I was a Cree, I didn't see a Uchi as my brother and sister, even though, even though some of the tribe members may have married people from my tribe. Or if I was a Choctaw, I didn't care about the Yamasi, just like how the Dahomey in, in, in Africa, they, they made the Europa slaves. You see, mm. see the European, he hates FBA because FBA knocks down the nationalities. See, when you say FBA, you no longer say that I'm a black Hebrew. You know, you don't you no longer say in a sense that I'm a black Muslim, I'm a black Protestant, I'm a Cherokee, I'm a Yoruba. You know, see, when you say foundation of black American. That brings all the black foundational people into one group. The white man doesn't like that because he wants you to be divided. Because he yeah. wants you, in a sense, to be able to run you over. That's why he hates the idea that we've created our own identification. And this is what, what Dr. Short is always talking about. We have to create our own identification. We have to create our own world. And see, that can only come from us taking the initiative and loving and believing in ourselves that's right yes can um there's a lot of people asking questions I, I okay really well ask the questions some of the questions now um the first question we have i gotta scroll up and i hope you're still in the room when we ask this is from uh israel uh nava i believe it's pronounced if black people were in america was the morans egyptian mayans, mayans uh mayans sorry you said mayans yeah, my pronunciation is messed up. Was the Mayans in Egypt? No, they were not in Egypt. The Mayan, the Mayan people, the Mayan is, is no such people called Maya. The mm. white man just made that name up as, as to identify these tribes who, who speak similar languages. Mm. The Mayan people was just like in North America. The Mayan people were were divided into two groups. The earliest Mayan people were black. Then the Mongoloid people came in, and then, see, every, I'm going to tell you the, tr the traditional way. The Mongoloid people would come in just like the white man. We'd be feeling sorry for these damn raggedy, raggedy ass people. They don't have shit. They come in with a fucking damn TP. And you go and you say, oh, you need some help, brother? You can, you can join my tribe. And what happened is, is after they got to be 20 and we became 10, well, they got to be a thousand, we became a hundred, they killed our asses off. And but that's the same it. thing they're doing with the illegals with us right now. That's what they're trying to do. Just like you right. in Chicago, Afro. You see mm -hmm. how you see how those Spanish people was begging for those illegal aliens to come and live in their neighborhood. Go over there and mm -hmm. live in, and live over there and get shot up about those uh, Spanish gangs. But what did mm -hmm. they move them to? They moved them to Woodlawn. They yes. moved them to Woodlawn. Because they wanted to take over you. Okay, so the Mayan Indians, we know that the Mayan Indians were black because they found skeletons in the Mayan Indians 
had sickle cell anemia. Only black people carry sickle cell anemia. You That's see. true. And so then, so then the Mayans, in a sense, the language of the Mayan. I, I I'm a linguist, so I did a lot of research, and all the Mayan languages, <clears throat> all the Maya languages have a vocabulary that's what what's called the Manding the Mandy or Mandingo language in West Africa. Mostly their entire vocabularies. And the reason they, they have the Mandingo language is because of the fact that the Omex were Mandingo people. But there were black people in America before the Omex people came. But when the Omex people came from West Africa, they brought pyramid building over here to the United States. See, some people, some people teach, some people are so stupid. It's a lot of stupid, ignorant ass people out there. Some people believe, some people believe that that it was human beings with the dinosaurs. And some mm-hmm. black people will tell you that that when what that when that when 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 the ancient land masses were uh were were joined together that black people moved moved to America when they separated. Go oh, ahead, Dr. Shaw. Uh, okay, well, no, um I Can- I think you've answered that question. Next question. Uh, the next question comes from our sister, Mix Miss Phoenix. How long did Dr. Short teach at Howard? I, I never taught at Howard, although as a grad student, I helped uh, Dr. Io Langley, who's deceased, do his classes. I never taught at Howard. I, okay. I was a student at Howard from 1997 to 2006 as a grad student undergraduate from 1992 to 1997. Uh, so were you a, a teaching assistant? A I was a teaching assistant, yes. Okay, yeah. So you taught at Howard, how many years? But, but, but not, not really. Not, you'll find, you know, there's some things that they do at these HBCUs that are quite criminal where uh, you were talking about my teacher, Dr. Yang, and others. I mean, you do research for teachers, help people put stuff together, but you didn't lecture their classes. They let certain students do it, but they didn't let others. So I didn't teach at Howard. Okay. Um, and, 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 th- and that's a crime. They should, they should have allowed. I, you'll find that uh, this is a successorship issue. And in particular, the African Studies Department is full of African teachers. And they don't do stuff like say an American teacher would, where you'd let a student uh, teach in your class. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? If you've dealt with them, Dr. Winners, you know what I'm saying. It's a power thing. Yes. So uh, you you absolutely could. And I mean, sometimes you know as much as, as the teacher does in certain areas. So no, I did not. So okay. I did not teach at Howard. I taught at Bowie, I taught at Lane College. I, I taught in Upward Bound. Uh, I taught at, uh, uh, what's this thing called? Um, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, of course, I did D.C. public schools. So uh, at Bowie University, I did for a year. They Students liked me. And if you know anything about teaching, if yeah, you're a popular yeah. black male teacher, they will fire you, in particular, if black male students yeah. like you they get afraid you're going to create a personality cult and hijack the school. You know that. So I taught there, and I also taught at Lane College, and this, they tried to fire me, and the students were ready to shut the school down, and uh, they blamed me for the students not wanting me to be fired. Mm. Love, I man, get, love is a bitch. I want to yeah. get to... I want to get to... Next uh, question. The next question comes from Emory Wills, what are the Carolina tribes? Are they war tribes? So this is like a two-part question. First, what are the Carolina tribes? And then second one is, are they war tribes? And I guess that goes for either one of you all uh, can answer. The, Carol- the Carolina tribes, it, it's so, it was so many of them. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's just like when you, go, when you go to Chicago and you say, what's the name of all the black churches? That's how the white man took us over. You had the UTs. You had, in a sense... You know, the Uchis, the Menans, the Manans, the Monacans, the Mandan. It was so many black tribes. It, it's, 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 so the, the, you know, the folks I've heard about would be the Blackfeet, Cherokee, uh, Creek. Uh, and then there are lots small. Well, that's she asked specifically oh, for North Carolina. So many small. Yeah, so it, it becomes it. 
in reality, uh, <laughs> if you ever talk to people that are First Nations and you ask them what they call themselves, they call themselves people. This whole idea of race and all this is, comes out of white nationalism and you're coming with a white abstract idea of how people classify themselves and then ask us to answer based from a white <laughs> world view that's not applicable. Well, they early, they, they early pick up the fact that they were better than us after Benjamin Franklin got through with them. They always, sure. they always insult us out just like during the Yamasi War in 1725, the Yamasi, the Yamasi was about to run the British, run the British out of most of uh, out of most of Virginia and Georgia, mm -hmm. Georgia mainly. They're about to run them out, and then the Cherokee betrayed them and turned on them. Every time, every time, every time we try to to be nice to those Mongoloid Indians, they put a foot up our ass. Mm. You got you got and, and you know what? That I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. I was doing a, a discussion with a phenomenal filmmaker. Shout out to Brother Isaiah Washington and Corsicana. But Isaiah Washington was saying that he thought about doing a Buffalo Soldier film, but he didn't want to do it because the Buffalo Soldier killed Indians. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, I wrote him back and said, Brother Isaiah, Indians killed blacks and enslaved blacks, and da 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 da. I, I mean, what, what, what's the point here? I, and I said to him, you know, uh, Doctor Winters, I want you to talk to 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 him because I he wants to do it, but he's worried we'll about see. about how he see. I'm going to say this. Right now, all of these uh, Plains Indian type, none of them show solidarity with anything for black and, and people. Not, not, ever. Only that, not only that, but look at this. It, it, was over, it was over 200 black tribes, 100 black tribes in California. You see, where those black tribes at today? Yeah, we know. We know that the white man, what he did is that he paid. He paid eight. He, he paid. I think it was eight or nine dollars for a female scout. It was six dollars for a a, a a boy a, a boy scout or child, and it was only five dollars for a male scout. Mm. Uh -huh. a male, a male and it's something else. We had an Indian slave trade for alcohol and guns. Yeah. They funded them to kill us. And mm. I don't not but brothers brothers sold each other too. Yes, Black they did. Yes they, yes, yes, they did. So that's back to my point. For that room, um, for that this room. idea of Indians just being these wonderful people. And give it back to the buffalo. Bullshit. It is just, just like, just like the lion ass, <clears throat> the lion ass Apache, lion ass Apache, and some of the, uh, some of the Ogala Sioux. They always talk about. They always say we didn't know, we didn't know nothing. We called them buffalo soldiers because they were black. That damn lie. There was nothing but black Indians out there. What happened to them? They killed them off. The dirty motherfucker. I'm sorry. Hey, so whatever you want to say, you are free to speak. Your mind. I, I want to say something I else. I got a reputation of all. Okay, okay. These, these Indians, these so called Indian types, um, who supported the Indian movement in the late 60s, early 70s? In case Indian. you don't know, black people did. What do the do? Indians, do they ever support any black cause? The answer is no. 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 Mm. Uh, you know, right now, the Indians sit back and they support the white supremacist practice of blood quantum where black people can't be recognized as being foundational. Yeah. But you and know they don't they say do? anything. They don't say anything about it. When the Indians attacked the Bureau of Indian Affairs right here in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., guess what? The black police and black people wouldn't let anybody do anything when the Indians trashed the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Yet they'll make it seem as if they were so damn militant and they came into D.C. No, black folk let them do that. And now, We've yeah. always backed it. Dr. Martin Luther King's last effort was to also help Indians support the same people who don't give a fuck about us. So I think Isaiah Washington, who made this great film called Corsicana, could make a great film about the Buffalo Soldiers 
and let the damn mongoloid Indians worry about their own issue. Yeah, let me tell you something. They have the American Indian Museum here in Washington, D.C. Uh, they don't like blacks to even be volunteers. There. They don't want us anywhere near it. Mm. And there's nothing that shows any black in it. It's a whole thing. It's some bullshit. And I'll go further. When I finished my undergraduate degree at Howard, I figured I wanted to learn more about my heritage. So I would call around to the Indian groups to volunteer. They refused me because I was black. Don't even want, don't, you're not welcome. You know, you know, when I, I, uh, I had a They're racist. They're very racist. I had a fellowship. Uh, I had a fellowship uh, when I did my, when I did my PhD at Loyola University in Chicago. And so we would have, we would have a meeting every year of, of all the, uh, all the, uh, uh, you know, uh, fellowship recipients. Every one of the so-called Indian fellowship recipients were Caucasians. They were white. They were white. See, you had to, you had to understand. See, he should talk to me. He should read my book. We are not just Africans. If he read my book, we were not just Africans. He would know that many of many of the uh, many of the Indians in our, our West were black Indians. Mm. Were black Indians. But see, the whole point is this: is that so? So the so when they so when the, when the Apache and the, and the, and and the uh, and the Sioux, the Sala Sioux, the Gala Sioux, when they talk about they don't know about black people, and they call in a sense, they say that the uh, that they call the black buffalo. So that's a damn lie, because all the Indians who who let their asses come on the place, they remember. See, you've been told you've been told that Indians lived in teepees. Black Indians didn't live in teepees. Black right. Indians lived in houses of stone. Black Indians mm. lived in houses made of wood. They built stockades around their houses. You see, that's right. Many and, people. In fact, in fact, they did genocide against black folks that lived in towns in Virginia. Right. John right. Smith and these other people would surround the places and set up what's called an ambuscade, and they would set the uh, stockade on fire. And if you tried to come out, they'd shoot you. You know they went they around killing the people in tribes I have family that come from of exterminating whole communities. They have one foundational aboriginal African community, Wall Street, Black Wall Street destroyed one after the other. They did this all over Virginia. They did it in Delaware. They well, did it in Maryland. I mean, they mass murdered the people. Yes. And, 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 and what they do as you'll have a mascot for a sports team or you'll have a an area geographic area named for the people that you exterminated right here in dc the black area that's always been black is called anacostia the anacosta were black people who've always been here yeah but they make you don't believe it and see this is what they did you know, many people don't know. Uh, I, I I invite all of you to uh, go to Google and uh, put in there Clyde Winters Thanksgiving. See, many people don't know that Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, was created because of what the white man would do with the foundational Aboriginal foundational Americans. And they, they played soccer. They would play soccer with the with the heads of black men they kill. Oh yeah, they did. They did that too. But this I wanna I wanna explain to them how they would get us. What they would do is is that you know they would they would invite the Indians, they would invite the black Indians to come and have a meal, a Thanksgiving meal. And then what they would do is that they would pump them full of rum. Then when the Indians go when in when the uh, black Indians would go back to their villages, the white man would surround the village around three or four a.m. Always three or four a.m. You see that in um and, and even the, the movie they made, Wounded Knee. Wounded Knee, you see how they always mm -hmm. attack, you know, before daylight. And what they would do is that they would set the houses on fire. And anybody that came out, they would shoot them. And anybody That's right. that, that didn't die, they would ship their ass over to, over to uh, Bermuda. And Bermuda. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the thing is this, is that many people, they talk about the Maroons. A lot of people don't, don't understand, as I tell you before, the first African slaves in Jamaica, yeah, they came to Spanish, but the first Maroons in, in, in Barbados, the first Maroons in Bermuda, the first Maroons in Jamaica, they were not in a sense from Africa. 
Mm. They were black Indians from America. Because we didn't take that shit. We didn't take that shit. Even today, I bet you, Afro, I bet your mama would have whooped your ass if you would have let somebody whoop your ass and you didn't fight. Didn't yeah, you? that's true. My mama too. You've been taught to be a warrior, man. Been taught to be a damn warrior. See, the fight is in you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that um, our people really need to understand because they teach us all the time. I'm going to be brief with this. They teach us all the time how it was white people who saved us. It was it was the good white people who fought the bad white people and they saved us. And, and you know, we lived happily ever after. But it's like in white Jesus history, saved us, us too. Us. You know, dude with long. Uh, he had locks like a tranny. <laughs> white Jesus saves you. I don't have any hair. You know, um, I want to ask. I want to ask a question. That we get a lot of pushback anytime a black person says that we're in we're native. Anytime we say we're we're Aboriginal, we get a lot of pushback. But white people don't. I remember doing a video about this like last year because everything said, belongs to white people. Right. Everything is white. So the people that are giving you pushback, especially if they say they're black, they're they are a inverted white supremacist or self-hating Negro who doesn't know they're self-hating Negro. And there's a scam. It's two sides of the coin. The white people say, go back to Africa. And the other side of the coin are what I call scam Africanists that say that you're all just an African and that's it. And uh, in other words, you can't have an identity in America, says some of these dumb niggas with kente cloth on this other shit. And it's ridiculous. But it's interesting. The white supremacists and these stupid conscious community scam Africans have the same mindset that we have no right to be here. And yet the scam Africanists don't have shit for you in Africa. Yeah, mm. and, they won't let you and the white folks think Africa belongs to them. Proof of that is how they had Gaddafi murdered and the blacks mass murdered within the last few years in North Africa. So Africa belongs to them and they don't want us going to Africa, except for if we're going to places that they control in Africa. The minute black folks started going to Africa in large numbers in the last, say, 30 years. Now you got Africa. You literally have the police have followed black folks to Africa to make certain that they behave. See, you have to understand that many black people, they suffer, they suffer from caves. Caves, C-A-I-D-S. Caves mean culturally acquired immune identity deficiency syndrome. What happens is, is that Harold Cruz, Harold Cruz, he wrote and he talked about the fact that, that many people have an imitation complex. And Harold Cruz said that many people have an Im imitation complex because they want to imitate white people. Our middle class wants to Im 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 imitate white people, the boule. So what happens is that many black people, not just, not just middle class black people, what they do is that they lose their culture. They, they, they become, they, they lose their immunity to whiteness and they want to steal whiteness. The way they steal whiteness is, 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 trying, is trying to get a black, trying to get a, a white woman or get a white man. That's why I look at it. Look, even if, like like look at life for she, she a damn up, she a damn in a sense dyke, and she had to go and she had to get a damn woman, white woman. You see, you see mm -hmm. Billy Porter, he got to have a white man. But so the whole point is this is that so many black people because they have caves, culturally acquired, they lose their immunity to whiteness, and once they lose their immunity to whiteness, they in a sense develop this debilitating disease because they want to change their identity. They want to have an identity as a pseudo white person, you see. Mm. And so it's true. caves, caves is what's destroying us. You're absolutely correct about that. Uh, a lot of black people, it, it's it's this like um this devil in their head whispering all the time in their ear, telling them white people are God. Hate and black you people. Need to be closer to that. Commit so, suicide. Yeah. Yeah. That's now what questions keep the questions coming. OK, uh, I would like. So I asked a question about the, the history of us being indigenous in that. So let me ask, because 
a lot of people were wondering when you were talking about the Irish and a lot of the, the Europeans that came here, they were not considered white. They were not considered white. And there was a lot of studies about how they be, they needed them to become white so they can boost their numbers against uh, the black people who they're are talking, on this land. They're talking about the indentured servants. I'm not talking, I'm talking about chattel, chattel black Irish slaves. Mm, they're talking okay. about indentured servants. And in fact, it wasn't, if you remember, it wasn't that many indentured uh, Irishmen. Most mm. of the most of the white Irish didn't come over here until they came over here during the potato famine. The yes. potato famine. The original Irish that came over here were black people. They came in the 1650s. 1650s. That's that's almost 100 years, I think, before the potato famine. You yeah, know, it's about it's 90 to uh, yeah. Don't get don't get it confused. There, there was two to see when when Oliver Cromwell when he took over Scotland and he took over and he took over Ireland what he did is that he took all the all the nick all the black people out see he took all the niggers out let me explain to you the the kings the kings of Scotland they called themselves niggers mm. niggers was a sacred name for the kings of Scotland and so then therefore in a sense that's why they started trying to make a joke about calling us niggers. So what happened is that Oliver Cromwell, he took he took all the black Protestants. There was still some black people left in Ireland and even in Britain. But all the black Irishmen who were Catholics, he made them specifically chattel slaves. But what happened is this. About 100 years later, this guy named Thomas, Thomas Cromwell, we don't know if Thomas Cromwell was related to, to Oliver Cromwell or not. But you know what Thomas Cromwell did? Thomas Cromwell destroyed 97%, 97% of all the pictures, the manuscripts, the murals of the original royalty of England and repainted all these black people white. Mm. Yes, Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell. And they and they and they moved. That's, why do you think a lot of these so-called a lot of these so-called families have a lot of heraldry and have a lot of in a sense crest of Moors and all that type of stuff? They weren't Moors, but when they took those black Irishmen's mansions over their castles, they took it. Listen, who do you think built the castles? Black people. Who do you think built London? Black people. Because they, they were the royalties, they were the niggers. The niggers, you see, and that's why, and that's why the black kings of Scotland call themselves nigger. I don't like the word nigger. Mm, I do. Oh, nigger. <laughs> yes. But, and so the black Irish don't get don't get it twisted. The black Irish they came in the 1600s and the 1700s. And also, have you heard about the the uh, Jacobites? Um, I'm not super familiar with them. Okay, well, the Jacobites, the Jacobites, in a sense, what they did is this, is that the Jacobites, they wanted to put back the relatives of King John back into, into the world. Because see, what they did is they went and found, they went and found a mulatto nigga over in, in Germany, King William, and then they made him, in a sense, the king of, uh, of, of, of England because he was a Protestant. And so then the Jacobites, when you read this uh, book, they had a spy. King William had a spy named... Uh, McKay. When you read McKay's book, he talks about all these rich people. If you look, if you look, if you look at, if you Google these rich people today, they're going to show a picture of a white man. But in his book, McKay described him as black, cold black, muddy black, broody black. See, see, as I tell you, we've been taught a lie. We've been taught a lie about our history because they don't want you to know. See, what did Dr. Short tell you? Dr. Short told you that they want us to be Pan-Africanists. They want us in a sense to just all want to be back in Africa. All of us, some of our ancestors were never in Africa. You know, Harold Cruz, when you hear when you read Harold Cruz's book, when you read his book, Rebellion or Rebel, Revolution or Rebellion, something like that, he talks about the fact because of our, our Indian heritage, because of our, our black European heritage, because of our African heritage, we are tripartite people, you see? And they they've stolen your history because you remember. They not only owe you, they not only owe us money for chattel slavery, 
the fact that our, our ancestors worked for nothing. They owe you money because they took away our damn land. That's right. They owe you so money. So we need two checks. Two checks. MFM. That's right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Tell them what that means. It means motherfucking money. Right on, baby. Uh, I want to get to some more questions. Cause Bring it on. Asking, I don't want them to feel like I'm not seeing it. Uh, the next one I see is from Bobby Jefferson. What are your what are the master teacher's thoughts on the late historian? Um, I was trying to pronounce this. Renato um, Rashidi. Rena yeah. So what are your what are your uh, takes on on I'm the historian? Biased. I'm by. Why don't you tell him your thoughts? Uh, um, I, I, I pass. Okay, pass. you pass. I, I, okay, I want to okay, hear your bias. I, I want to hear your bias. <laughs> I'll take this. In 1980, in 1980. Uh, Renoka Rashidi invited me out to, uh, out to out to speak at Oakland College. So when I so when I went out there, I took a whole lot of stuff on uh, on 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 black people around the world, and I and I gave him this stuff. Although although I gave him all of this material on ancient blacks, he never mentioned where he got the material from. Haven't, haven't you ever noticed that Renoka Rashidi? He always had a lot of picture books, like kitty books. But he never wrote about how the people got there because he was using my shit. I'm sorry to say, he was using my stuff. But see, he's like that's what that's what Dr. Short and I are trying to do. Dr. Short and I, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get black people to stop trying to stab each other in the back, stop betraying each other. Black men need to work together instead of, in a sense, always trying to take from each other. You see, right. The it's term is brother fuckers. Yeah, we gotta be we gotta be brother fuckers. You see? Stop being brother not fuckers. Literally, not literally. Yeah. But the point is this is that we had to work together. We had to work together. And yeah. see, that's what that's what that's what we're trying to do. We don't want to be like Renoko Rashidi, who stabbed people in the back, took their work. You see, he, he went over to India to the Dravidians. He used my name to get but to he screwed them. the people. I met the people at the 22 years ago, when I went to the World Conference Against Racism, and part of what I did there was show solidarity with the Dravidians, because I worked in the uh, uh, Dalit movement for 10 years. And I met people from India. By the way, Renuko did not go. And I met people from India that knew Renuko. I showed them Renuko's books, and they had never had a copy. He didn't even share that. No. They didn't even know the information he compiled, which means he pimped them, took their pictures, did stuff, and never shared it. Didn't even tell people or bring them to conferences. Those folks had nothing to show for their association with Renuko. Now, that's what I got directly from the Dravidians there. We're talking about folk blacker than attire with straight black hair. Renuko use them he pimped them he screwed them and go get if you go get the book written by the uh leader of the dollars he mentions in there that that renoko came after 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 he told them that he knew me see mm. renoko, are you talking about rashikar which which one which the one? one that did the book black untouchable yeah it's in there in the first few pages. okay it's in there yeah now you know i know him yeah. he worked with dr Klein did the forward for that book black untouchable you guys can pick that up uh if it's still in print black untouchable but renuko um did not he only he became a rock star uh because he has this uh unique information i'll be back i'll be back but but he didn't he didn't empower people other than to be a man up in years bone and young girls i'm not saying that sex is wrong but I'm thinking, who did he groom to replace himself? You're younger than I am, but notice, I'll give you a book. I'll give you a contact. You know, I'll, I want you to do, you're doing great. I, I want more. I wish I had a class full of people like you to talk to. And if you do better than me, great. Someone should be better than me. Renuko, it's like it's old boomers that don't want anybody else who wasn't born in the 40s or 50s 
to do anything. We can't exist because those niggas existed. I'm, I'm telling you, the good Lord can't hand out enough strokes, heart attacks, aneurysms, and dementia to phase that kind of boomer's ass out. Yes. Now, I want to ask a question about the American Maroon film. Um, and I, maybe we can re-ask this when Dr. Winters comes into the room. Now, the American Maroon film not only really broke down very excellently the our indigenous history and, you know, the history of how, you know, black people got to the land that we now know as uh, America and how we were fighting against slavery. But it also touched on a lot of like the rumors against like the um, Underground Railroad and how white people saved uh saved black people so let me let me ask you a question does does this history do you feel like this history is just something for us to fantasize over or is this history going to really does knowing this history actually change black people um do you feel like knowing this history will embolden the next uh, generation of black people to be well, more empowered and fight against white supremacy. History is a lot like a toothbrush and toothpaste and floss. If you don't use it, you just have it. Um, mm -hmm. Harold Cruz, who we can cite, made a comment, and I will put it in crude, nasty uh, millennial language so you'll enjoy it. Basically, Harold Cruz said that black history was basically an exercise of celebratory masturbation mm -hmm. instead of really looking at what needed to be done for our people to be liberated. Do you get where I'm coming from? So yeah. most of black history, it's basically a big uh, jerk off and jizz contest of how many names you can remember and who did what and. Uh, oh, they invented the first electronic dildo, but the patent was given. I mean, nobody, black history, and this is my issue with folks in Africana studies that can tell you about Sun Ra's and Sonny Rollins, and they can just tell you all these great personalities, and let's feel good. Someone black didn't go to jail. Someone black wasn't on welfare. What real history does as gives an identity to a people and to a, 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 a nation with strategies for how to either free, enhance, or change their circumstances. Right. That's what real history does. Black folks have a kind of stillborn, aborted baby history where it's a baby, but the shit's dead. It's dead history if you're only talking about Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman every fucking uh, 12 months. What we should be talking about, and uh, I like the way that American Maroons, it connected the marinage to black power. Right, and I want right. to add something else that it, it, he didn't go in depth in because the film was so long, but people need to understand that what you call a black ghetto in reality, is a maroon colony, an urban maroon colony of black folks fleeing what was peonage and, and, and debt slavery down south, moved to the urban north where they had force of numbers to live more or less the way they wanted to. So even black people leaving the rural south was an effort to be a maroon in an urban context. So marinage has always been an effort to break off and have our own thing. See, what I hold on, let me finish. I'm almost done, Doc. What I hope comes from this film, and I believe it will, a whole lot of people are going to recognize for the first time that kissing ass never freed anybody. Yeah. In fact, it may not get a strip or a tip. You must fight. We've been fighters. And there's a piece in the Civil War. Uh, we could do another American Maroons. People seem to forget that the black men, some of the first people who joined the Union Army, and I was in the papers of the United States Colored Troops this week, 
there were thousands and thousands of black men who had run away from slavery in New England and in other places that when the time came where they could get guns, they came out of the woodwork. They, they didn't even know what to do with that many black men. There was a propaganda lie that was going around in 1862 and 1863. Would black men fight? After all these years of being afraid of us having guns or doing anything, then they came up with the lie that blacks wouldn't fight. Yeah. And when the blacks began to show up, there were urban disturbances of white people terrified at the specter of all these black men that all of a sudden showed up that wanted guns to fight. We had near riots here in Washington, D.C. There were problems in Baltimore. There were problems... Delaware is so racist, they wouldn't even have a United States covered infantry troop for Delaware right. because almost, almost, almost 85 percent of blacks in Delaware were free before the Civil War started. Yeah. So in reality, if people understand that we are still fighting for the things that some of the Maroons had hundreds of years ago, we are less free than those people were. That's right. Mm. And also you gotta remember is that they made a movie. They made a movie about they made a movie about a black regiment that went out and they all got killed. They all lost. Yes, glory. That's right. But see, have you noticed they're not they're not talking about the movie Emancipation. Why aren't they talking about the movie Emancipation? I'm gonna tell you why. If you look at Emancipation, it's about it's a love story. It's where it's where a man tells his wife, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I will be back to you and my children. They take him to the plantation. For the first time in history, they show what the plantations were surrounded by. When they took when they took Will Smith to the plantation, it was surrounded by damn heads. The heads of black people cut off. Many people don't know that around every plantation, they had a black person's head. And that head would stay up there. And when it rot, they get another nigger's head and put it up there. Yes! Mm. They showed us an emancipation. They show him this emancipation where they're beating the hell out of out of Will Smith, and he still fought back. Finally, he escapes. They show him when he was fought in the Civil War. His unit won. He lived. He returned back to his returned back to his uh, wife and family. And, and, and that's and what that's that's exactly. Let me share something. Go ahead. The black people resisted so much. I want you to guess, based on history, ask your audience. I'm going to give people five chances. Which state provided the greatest number of black men to fight for freedom in the Civil War? In fact, I'll let you go to seven. Don't you say anything, Dr. Winters. Come on, seven, come chances. On the chat. Come on seven chances. Seven chances. Seven chances. Come well, on, as, as the audience is, is giving their chances, Dr. Winters, you can finish your statement and then we'll get to the audience's answers while they while they're coming up with them. Well, I'm, I'm already I'm already I'm already done. I just wanted to let you know is that 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 we had we had some very great memories. You know, they have any we could make a real Civil War movie, but we saw the black the black guys winning. They don't ever want to show us winning. You know, but, but, but you know what? That's oh, going to change, Dr. Winters. You know why? Go ahead. The lady I introduced you to, my boss, the publisher of my books, is a filmmaker. And we just agreed today we're going to do something about this Civil War thing. Because I found the pension papers of my great-grandfather uh, yesterday. We're going to do it. They show glory because they wanted to see blacks get massacred. And you by the, the way, man. and the white man... They named the community that I went to school in. It's called Shaw and Shaw University. All this stuff for the white dude who was an inept, stupid, unqualified guy who got the people killed. Yeah. And they make a hero out of a bad white commander. But let's ask. We're going to do some guesses. Where do they think most of the black volunteers for the yeah, uh, U.S.? Uh, a lot. So we, we have some people who are saying um, Mississippi. No. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. Saying uh, Maryland or Texas okay. or Florida or Carolina. There's a lot of, a lot of states. No. Another one All saying those, Iowa. No. Okay. No. 
Keep going. Uh, another one saying the next one, Florida. You already said no to Florida. Uh, Maryland. I think you said no to no. Maryland. Tennessee. No. Uh, Virginia. No. So, was it South Carolina? No. Uh, someone says North Carolina. No. And Let me answer. Georgia. Okay, no. Kentucky. Kentucky. Kentucky okay. had the largest number, somewhere between twenty and 30,000, uh, greater than 10% of all the U.S. covered infantry came from Kentucky. Yeah. Mm. And for that reason, white people punished and have been punishing blacks in Kentucky because so many blacks fought from Kentucky. Kentucky was one third black in 1860 within a generation afterwards, Kentucky dropped down about 5% black. They ran them, they burned them. They had things called expulsions where whites would show up again at three, four in the morning and black folks had to get out or they all would be killed. Right. You see, a lot of people, a lot of people believe that it was the white man. If you, I know you heard that during the Civil War that, uh, that, that, that a black soldier couldn't surrender. He was killed. Yeah. A, lot of yeah. people, a lot of people think that it was a white man started that. No, it was our so-called mongoloid Indian friend from Oklahoma. They're mm. the ones who started that policy that any black man who surrendered, you killed them. And that was our that was our mongoloid Indian friends. FBA don't have no. We got no friends. We got hey, no hey brother Winters, do can do you are you on Instagram? No, uh, no. We need to get you on Instagram. I want you no, and no, 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 no. And, you guys stay up too late. I got to get my beauty sleep. No, no. I'm not talking about staying up late. I I want I want you to to. Give me a citation for that, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a book called White Rage, Black Wrath, where black soldiers began massacring and return whites. In fact, I want to say this about the people in North Carolina, and that's why uh, a lot of people don't know that the Ku Klux Klan, even that is a copy, because there were black folks wearing sheets killing white folks in Northeast Carolina when they came out the Dismal Swamp. The black folks where I come from, they were given weapons by General Grant because they were white soldiers that didn't want to surrender. The best folks that hunted down and killed the white folks that didn't want to surrender, that wanted to cause some uh, post-conflict bullshit, they were mowed down by black folks in Southside Virginia and Northeast to North Carolina. You know what I'm talking about, Dr. Winters. Yeah. They, killed, they killed them all. If you, and so to this day, the Maroons came out and the Maroons came out with guns and they st the people were Robert E. Lee and them wanted to surrender when all the black folks started fighting. Yeah, They don't yeah. talk about that. The people, the last you thing they want to do is have to fight black folks who were angry. See, see, the, the whole important thing, that's why you had to understand the Maroon, the American Maroon is, is a movie that really allows black people to understand our greatness. Understand that we weren't cowards. But okay, here. Here's the book I'm talking about. It's called The Dalit Untouchables. And I'll read, I'll read page uh page 35. And by the way, uh the forward is written by my mentor, a black gullah by the name of Yusef Klein, yeah, who so was Malcolm said, Malcolm page, X's uh leader of the OAAU in Canada. Page 35, it says. It all began with Clyde Ahmed Winters, guest editorial of September 16, 1985, African Origin of the Glorious Dollars, which opened for the eyes of the entire African American population and brought them close to us. The result, Renoka Rashidi came rushing to India and inaugurated the first All India Dollar Writers Conference. See, I don't have to lie. I don't have to lie. This man mm. stole shit, you see. But look, this is a book you everybody needs to read. Rebellion or Revolution. That's Rebellion the book I sent you. Everybody needs to read that. We need to do a workshop, Brother Afro Elite, on Harold Cruz. Right. Harold Cruz is one of the greatest black thinkers. All the boule, all our traders, all the people that hate our guts that are operating on the inside, 
the same way they say demons tremble at the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. the coons tremble at the name of Harold Cruz. That's mm -hmm. why I sent that shit to you. When you're oh, older dude. Negro, Harold Cruz, that's the thing that scare all of them. They all hate him. If you say Harold Cruz, they start getting mad. They want to fight you. Because Harold Cruz debunked all their asses. When you read that book, Rebellion and Revolution, he points out that Dr. King, even faggot, uh, what's his name, uh, Byatt Rustin, all knew the March on Washington was a failure. Mm. This shit was fucked up 60 years ago. And I'm hoping that American Maroon gets people to understand that it, you ain't going to get nothing singing, as Malcolm said. You're going to have to start swinging. And the beauty the beauty of American Maroon is that, what does it do? First it talks about the Moors. Then it talks about our Aboriginal FBA. Then it goes into Black Power. I had That's to correct. Right. I had to correct Black Authority, and I had to correct Professor Black Truth. I said, I, I, I said I'm getting tired of you talking about the baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer. Boomer. I'm 72 years old, but I was not part of the civil rights movement. When they had the civil rights movement, I was only 13, 14, 15, you see? But what it did, when we when it got to 64 and it got to 68, we burned the damn cities down. We were out there, man. I lived in Chicago. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, 47th Street, you see? They, you went, if you went in the alleys, on every alley, they had, they had the coordinates. I was in ROTC. They had to the coordinate for military in case they had to lobby in artillery, you see? Because mm -hmm. we were ready to fuck them up. We are ready to die. And then, then people like the Black Authority, and then people like Professor Black Truth said, don't listen to no old nigger. Yeah, that's why black people ain't got shit today. They don't want to listen to no damn body, but these new jacks, these new jacks, listen, listen. And, 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 and we need to be honest about this because we wasn't a damn. We didn't cause the damn problems. Well, yeah. Um, well, I've heard I've heard uh, on several occasions that uh, Jason uh, Jason Black and Professor Black True. I don't I don't. They're not referring to all as the absolute generation. I think that they're just referring to that specific. No, he he, he no. always says the baby boomers. We, we were the ones. Who do you think joined the Black Panthers? Who do you think got killed? Who do you think was a new Republic of Africa? That wasn't no old niggas. That was teenagers like me. And you know what? He's running. right because Exus like, started in 65. Yeah. So there's no way that any of the people my age could have been involved and, and I was, in that. And I was only 15. So the people, the people that are really bad are the silent generation niggas that came up well, I guess you couldn't find a potato during the Great Depression, so you're so busy getting crumbs, you're happy. So there's an over, there's an overlap of that. In fact, I want to say something to you. It was people from the silent generation that helped and formed the police to lock up and kill the boomers, like the no-good silent generation folks that had the people killed at right. Southern University and had them killed at Jackson State. You had... A generation before the boomers that were having the boomers that were radicals sent to Vietnam to die. And see, and see, that's the beauty of it. And see, that's what I liked about American Maroon. American Maroon showed that the baby boomers, we were the black power generation, but they don't teach you about black power. That's what that's what's going to make the Maroons, the American Maroon movie so great and so beautiful. Is it is the only movie. Afro Elite, you can't name one movie that talks about the black power movement from the perspective of the grassroots. Yes. They're always talking about a boule. Whenever they talk about black history, they talk about the boule. Oh, W.B. Du Bois. Uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 Frederick Douglass. They always talk about middle class people. Our history was made by the grassroots. Mm -hmm. yeah. Young niggas, see, look, you in your 20s, Afro. I bet yeah. right now, I bet right now couldn't no white man get you to get you to get on your knee. He can't make your ass bow because you feel you'd rather die. And that's how the that's how we felt. And yet you had the nerve of these people, the black authority, Professor Black Troop, talking about the baby boomers. We're the ones who are still in jail today. Yeah. We're uh, the ones who were murdered. We're the ones who 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 took the things. We're the ones who burned up the fucking cities. I went to the University of Illinois Champaign Urbana. You know how I got there? 
because we burned up 47 straight. We burned up 63rd straight. See, mm. we didn't well, put uh, he, ready to die. He okay. has a point. I want and to, the, um, so hold on. The coon generation is the silent generation. The ones that went through the Great Depression would kiss in the ass in order to feel good because they, they came up feeling deprived. Right. Mm. Yeah, well, we have a lot of people asking questions. Okay, so, so well, I, I do, let, I we'll bring, bring on the questions. questions. Uh, I just want to, you know, state one one thing, because I don't speak for any other man, but I don't believe that uh, Jason Black or Professor Black Truth means to offend everybody. I think they might just come off very um, very strong. Well, they might come well, off strong, but well, I don't, let me I don't say this. I, I feel you, but I'm going to say something of a lot of people these days, which would make people angry. A lot of people don't know what the fuck they're talking about, even when they're quite informed. And what mm -hmm. I will say of some people in the new black media is that they're not collaborative. They're not. They're, they want to be the only ones talking. When you hear people talk about the new black media, they're only talking about three people. I'm not jealous oh, of anyone who are five, but yeah. it's it's you can't have anything with just five people when you're talking about 50, 60, 100 million people. You're out of your collective mind. We need networks of people. And part of networking is real analysis. Real analysis means that uh, when Tariq learned about Dr. Winters, he talked to Dr. Winters. Do you get where I'm coming from? Some mm -hmm. folks are only happy with their own thoughts and ideas, and we have to work a little harder than that. And by the way, I listen to Professor Black Truth, and most of the time, I, I, I mean, I listen to him every day. But all of us can learn something. That's another thing about black men and egos. Uh, our dicks aren't as big as they, we think they are, and our, our egos are too large. We need to have an ego that is not narcissistic and malignantly so. Meaning, whereas if I'm saying something, I'm open to criticism or critique or analysis. And I understand if you really know, and Dr. Winters is a historian, historians operate with a thing called generalities, but not generalizations. What he's responding to is those two gentlemen have used a generalization, but not a generality. You have oh. to qualify speech when you say the baby boomers. That is a generalization. If you say some of the baby boomers, that's a generality. Okay. Uh, generalization, if it's not founded in fact, is false, it's a lie, it's not helpful. Yeah. And I and trust me, I don't want to throw I as I said, I list I listen to certain people every single day, every time the alert comes up. As something yeah. else I'm going to say that's critical. For someone to be willing to trash all the boomers as coons and yet embrace Black Fags Matter as a representative voice of Black people's resistance, there's an issue here. Black Lives Matter is an enemy of Black people. So it's yeah. interesting. Black Lives Matter, people who burnt Black institutions infiltrated by trans and anarchists who murdered Black men in prison, that's the face of our struggle in the streets. And yet the people that were actually in the streets of Dr. Winter's generation are the traitors. Really? Who are you working for? I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm not trying to dismiss the, the, the great work done, but am I getting this right, doctor, that you, you, make, right. you make people paid by our enemies heroes, That's and right. yet you dismiss an entire generation while ignoring the heroes that came up who had who didn't have access to the same information that the very people making these unfounded generalizations have. And that's it's it's but that's wrong. You pay you pay a price when you're a fighter. Yes. You pay a price when you're a fighter fighter. Dr. Jordan told you the universities that he taught at 
that he used to teach at, you see, because of the fact that he loved his people and he let people know. See, when you let people know that you love black people and you let people know that, that you went to that university and that college and you didn't come out a damn fool, you didn't come out, come out of Trump, they see you as an enemy. They hate, they hate Professor. They hate Dr. Short because Dr. Short loves his people. Dr. Short loves it being a man. And this is scary. You just don't know. It's scary. You see? Scary, man. Absolutely. I want to get to the questions. Oh, real yeah. quick. Bring them on. Uh, the question is from Emory Wills asks, Dr. Short, is Bowie State in good hands? No. Okay. Why, why? I'll give you a quick. I'll give you a quick story. When I was teaching at Bowie, the students uh, we were given a book by um, uh, Claiborne Carson. You know him, the punk out in California, Doctor uh, Winters. But uh, he edited a book with other historians, and in the book, and it talked about slavery. It said that black women liked uh, having sex with their masters in slavery, mm. and. I was uh, lecturing a class and asked about black women and slavery. And one of my favorite students said, black women like having sex with their masters. And I almost cussed that girl out in class. I almost flipped, I chipped on her. I was so angry, I demanded that she come to my office and tell me to my face that black women like getting raped in slavery. And she apologized to me and said, Dr. Short, it's not my opinion, but that's what's in the book. I hadn't read the whole book. When I read the thing in the book, I, I went nuts. I called up Claiborne Carson. I laid that nigga out. You know, I got in trouble for challenging him. In other words, I'm not supposed to say that black women don't like being raped by white men. So I'm seen as a bad faculty person for going to Claiborne Carson and saying, who put this crap in this book that my kids are reading? I finally got them to be able to read a book. And then these girls are being damaged, thinking that being raped by white men is good. Who are you? It's evil. That's and, the you know, he called, he called, he called my boss to complain because I ripped his ass because I got him to admit he had a white colleague. When they say colleague and you hear black professionals, it means I, I take it up the ass from white people who do the same work as me. So the white dude, he didn't even read his chapters. He just took it because he was white. So I got in trouble for demanding that people not give us materials that justify women being raped. That means I'm not qualified to teach. The same person that made certain I wasn't renewed at Bowie, I had an opportunity to walk into a class at Bowie. I'll say his name, Sammy Miller, who's Boule, who's Cap Alpha Psi, was doing a class on American history, and he had students in college taking Xerox copies and filling in the names of the states with the state capital. What? That was collegiate work. What? He's been there for 45 or so years. I was only allowed to be there for a year. Wow. That's my boss. I was replaced by an African with not a real degree that didn't even connect with the students. Students loved me, hated the African, but they didn't want me. And in fact, they let the white teachers and others decide that I shouldn't be continued. That's Bowie. Bowie's library is so inferior until they were supposed to get hundreds of thousands of dollars and they didn't get it. The school is quiet. The, the students don't really learn a lot. It's sad. They don't teach. They just pass them through. And that's what happens at a lot of HBCUs. Because if you really teach the students, I was told when they had the faculty meeting where they illegally didn't continue me, we can't keep short here. It's been quiet. We don't want any problems. You mean me asking the students to read is a problem? Yes. So the Boule and these HBCUs are turning out an inferior intellectual pro product. As long as they can keep going into debt to get the finan federal financial aid, they don't care a damn about the students. Look, look and the thing that they hate the most are serious teachers and serious students. They don't want them. Look at how Howard, Howard was giving uh, Ukrainians free tuition. 
Howard True. University would give full scholarships to white students. In fact, there was a white student that was spreading uh, HPV, screwing all the sisters, giving them HPV. I almost got kicked out of school for exposing it. Oh, wow. I'm racist because I think black women shouldn't be infected. Oh, I can tell you, I hate the fucking boule. I hope all of them die from the COVID booster shots. They're in the way. I mean that. Well, we 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 won't talk about that on. We won't talk about. Yeah, that. yeah, it's a <laughs> certain thing. But I I respect your passion, and I respect you telling the truth about that and exposing that because that's um that's a truth that needs to be. Out and there and I'm telling you, do you know this white dude? He was a broke ass person from France, and he claimed to have a castle. They didn't even check. All the niggas in the faculty in the political science department were nice to this guy because they wanted to be able to spend the night in his castle in France. And he's on financial aid. You don't need financial aid if you have a castle in France. But, you know, just it's I mean, man, if I told you the stories about those coons at Howard and that no good Caribbean president that's outgoing, who hates black Americans, the foreigners have taken over. And they just purged the uh, Howard of FBA. Uh, oh my God! It, yeah, it, another question. Let's not talk about Howard. Okay, Those okay. I call yeah, it yeah. Coward Coward University because they're afraid to be black. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Now, um, we have a couple more questions, but this question, the next question in line, comes from Wired Sports, asking, "Why was the March on Washington a failure?" Because that was stated well, earlier. Well, the March on Washington didn't accomplish what it was supposed to do, which was jobs, freedom, and um, and basically statehood for the District of Columbia. If you don't know what the purpose of the March on Washington was, then you would think it was a success. Uh, if you read uh, Harold Cruz's uh, Rebellion or Revolution, he quotes Bayard Rustin that said that the march was a failure because black people don't really have an ideology or plan for freedom. We've become addicted to gimmicks. Black Lives Matter is a gimmick. The National Asshole Network is a gimmick. Uh, Mr. Crump is a gimmick. The CBC is a, a gimmick. The NAACP <laughs> is a gimmick. All of it. Everything has been a gimmick except for things like Black Power, Republic of New Africa, anything that may actually help us, you don't know about because the Boule and the Democratic Party and the Republicans work together to make certain that Black people don't sit down and really think about how we get this goddamn boot off of our neck. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I want to get to um the next question because i don't want people to you know ask a question and leave so and and thank you very much for the super chat we, we've been having super chats and i i've seen every single last one of them i want to salute everybody for salute. all of your thanks for the money we thank you on behalf of afro elite for the motherfucking money for this brother's platform thank we you. need i want all of you to get send this platform out to 50 people. This brother needs 10,000 followers. MFM, MFM. We got MFM. to get the brother. MFM. He needs some money. Y'all heard it. I didn't say it. It was them. It was well, them. That's okay. I'm a preacher's kid. You want me to get my tambourine? Lord, we need some money up in here. Brother Afro. Preaching the words. Oh, oh no. he's so good. Oh, he's Amen. telling the truth. Yes. Young man, he's full of the spirit. Y'all need to lit up off that money. Yes. Uh, it's not yours. Amen. God gave it to you to say it. Help this brother out. Lord, help him. Send some super chat. Give me some 20. You don't like Jefferson? Give him up. You don't like Jackson? Give him up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Thank you. Y'all heard the doctors. Y'all heard them. <laughs> and that was some great thing. I like that. We're going to have to do a whole thing afterwards. You know, um, but definitely, I want to thank you both for being here. Let me get to the next question. It says, uh, this is from FBA um, NYC. He says, salute to Afro Elite, Dr. Short, and Dr. Winters. 
The question is, does HBCU stand for Historically Boule College and Universities? It should stand for Historic Booty Colleges and Universities, because that seems to be all that you can get up in there. It does. Now, let me... Um, and it is a Boule... Uh, look, these colleges were designed for the house niggas, it w and house niggas and to create teachers that would be in segregated schools. Um, we need to understand that HBCUs were also basically the sexual fantasy island for the black elite. Uh, so if you wanted to meet, you know, send your girl off to, to school and she could meet someone. And uh, the there are some people who educated these places but with great resistance, all you need to do is look at the history of, say, Howard University. Howard University fired Carter G. Woodson. Howard University fired Du Bois. Howard yeah, University yeah, fired yeah. Toni Morrison. Howard University fired Francis Cress Welsing. Howard University fired Tony Brown. When you get great people at these schools, they get run out or destroyed. Those people capable of educating or conveying are not welcome. If you want to be a successful black faculty, sell your soul and go to a white school. You'll be able to teach, get to travel, go to conferences. But if you work at the HBCUs, most of the faculty at these HBCUs are whites, foreigners, and Asians, and they hate the black American teachers that are concerned because many of those schools are subpar. They need to be shut down. And if anything, all they are recruiting grounds for people to be uh, freaks, divine swine, boule cannon fodder. Uh, and I like the idea of there being black universities. It's an idea. It doesn't exist yet. And mm. if you look at the chart of Howard University, it is not a black university. It's a university for what? Young people. Yeah. Not specifically for blacks. And I served on the board of trustees at Howard and tall cart partner of Parsons, the little nigga that used to be on the board of GE, Dr. Winters. He and I had an argument in the boardroom of Howard University because he felt I was irrational to think that Howard shouldn't be more than 20 percent white. He felt that Howard should be more than 50 percent white. Yeah. Oh, wow. In other words, Howard University in 1967 wanted to become a majority white school. If you start looking, many of these HBCUs are becoming predominantly Hispanic yeah. and white because the boule is oriented towards ethnic, racial and intellectual suicide and destruction of black people. That is the purpose. This is why they privilege those folks. A house nigger is always an enemy, a traitor unto death to his people. See that that's one of the reasons why when I when I was at Illinois, we had the original people, we had the Harold, we had Harold Cruz, or we had people who was taught by Harold Cruz. They taught us at the university. So we came out well versed, well versed in our history, our culture, our political science. But see what happened is this is that they put us into a period of amnesia. What happened is is that they wanted black people, see, black people. When we said black power, that gave us an identity. That was a dangerous damn word. Because see, for years, the white men had told us that the Negro, that black people were ignorant, black people were, were inferior, black people couldn't learn. But when we started declaring black power, Ungawa, black power, when we said black power, the white men said, we got to get rid of that shit. Because see, black power unified black people into one group. That's why they brought in crack. That's why they, in a sense, put so many black people in jail. That's why they ran. That's why they closed down. They brought in feminism, too, oh, yeah, to make black women hate black men and kill black babies and, and, and kill and the family. And gayness. Gay, all of it. And, and but not, you know what? The gay and the feminists work together. That's that's a Siamese twin of, of social cultural death. Well you're, well, you're right about that, but I don't have anything against gay people, but they use them to take away the movement. They use, because see, if you get because the movement is in somebody's jaws or in somebody's balls. Excuse me, excuse me. This is what my father taught me. He said, anybody get fucked, you fuck them up. A gay person gets see, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Anybody get fucked, you fuck them up. And see, that's why we can't go anywhere. 
That's why they have all these these people like Billy Porter and, and these other people. And Oprah Winfrey, shit, and, call that stud out. Well, well, she, well, she get a deal done. She be she be sticking them with her her deal and though. Gail. I don't know about all that, but all I gotta say is this: it is it is hard to be a black man because to be a black man. You might live with your mama till you're 70 years old. You know why? I, I know what that's like. <laughs> you know why? You know why? Because, see, when, when the white folks know you got a mind, when the white folks know that you speak your mind, they're going to try to keep you from getting jobs. They're going to hog. They're going to. You are not going to even know it. You know, look, right now, anybody out there, anybody out there, Google Clyde Winners. When you go there, they're going to have a theme from Rational Wiki. And Rational Wiki say, Clyde Winters is a black supremacist. I'm not a black supremacist, but I got a troll that's been following me for years, and he were, and he writes for Wikipedia, and he's able to put on my page where, where they mention I wrote 40 books. I got articles published on genetics. I, I'm a well-known scholar. I got articles all over the damn place, but they dare put right there that rational wiki thing saying I'm a, a black supremacist. You see, because no. of the fact is this, the lucky thing about me is all praise alone to God is my kids are all grown. You know, my wife used to tell me before she died, my wife died in 2020. She said, Clyde, don't get me killed. I love you, but don't get me killed. But see, that's the threat you're under. That's the threat you're under. If they can't kill, if they don't kill you, they're gonna keep you unemployed. Or they get your children. Yes. Yes. See, look at Martin Luther King's kids. Yeah. Look at Malcolm's kids. But look at how they look at how they, they even sent that Hebrew to kill his mama. Hmm. Martin Luther King's mama was killed by Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And people Hebrew don't a lot of people don't even really um know about that the history of what the families actually had to go through. We know about um, you know, Dr. King and Malcolm, but we don't know too much about well, the they, they killed his mama, they killed his wife, they killed his brother 18 months. They yeah. were born 18 months apart. They killed him 18 months apart. Yeah. Oh wow. See? It's 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 the struggle goes on and one of the things I really don't like about I have to say this about fake ass black Christian ministers in particular, and the boule is that we have to be friends to everybody. No, we don't. The Bible says be ye separate. It basically says you're going to have lots of enemies. We have been taught that we're supposed to be open with everyone while everybody's closed with us. You wouldn't go out with the woman a hundred times if she never kissed you and definitely have to give up ass by a second or third time or at least talk about it. Well, We've been open with everybody and everybody's been closed with us. It's time for us to close to ourselves and make everybody either prove that they're worth dealing with or to hell with them. See, and, and that's, that's what being a people is. And see, that's why that's why they pick and choose. They, they pick and choose your intellectuals. You know, they want you to know about about uh, Gates. You know, uh, Gates and, 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 and Gates is a, Gates is, is in fact that's the other thing we have to say about HBCUs and so forth. The HBCUs are full of people who are suck ups, coons, foreigners, and even the black intellectual tradition, black studies, all of this is dominated by non historians that tend to be Africans and Caribbeans and now Afro Latinos. Anybody. <laughs> but a black American male in particular. That's if they get a woman, she's a feminist that hates black men, okay, you know, like and probably and not that pretty. Like a you, get a, you get an ugly girl, you know, the, the ugly girl that's been made fun of and, you know, cause she looks like a Brillo pad with the weave on and it's, you know, she's going to dog all the young men in the program. Yeah. And you know, just like Asante, Asante, he's the head, he's the head of, in a sense of, uh, of African studies at Temple. And he's getting head too. He got his degree. He got his. He got. He got his degree in literature. Yeah. Doc. Doc. Doctor Greg Carr. He got his degree in law. And mm -hmm. and, and, and and Gates got it in literature. And you yeah, keep literature, saying Gates, these people literature. in literature. No. Literature. They're not historians. They're yeah. not. See, they're scared yep. of people. They're scared of people like me. And they're scared they, of they, people they, like Doctor Short. They don't like, like historians. Historians are frightening 
to right. people. You see, mm. and, and, and do you know it, it's at many HBCUs today, they got white teachers teaching Afro-American and black history. In fact, when I was at Lane College, the woman that was there before me was in the Daughters of the Confederacy. A white supremacist woman set up the curriculum for the department. Think about that. See. Okay. I mean, that's you can't make this shit up. Somebody in the chat room asked uh, Dr. Short, what's your IG? So so everybody knows, because we got about 200 people in the room, all of their information is in the description below. But so, so you guys... Uh, his uh, Instagram, Twitter, um, and uh, all of that is in the description below. Right. So if you guys wanted to to know that, right. I have a I have a question because I don't uh, want to keep you all too too long. But um, my question is: We know with with empowerment films like the American Maroon, and shout out to our brother Tariq Nasheed for Tariq directing Nasheed. that. Um, mm -hmm. And he's directed many other masterpiece movies. And we we've already discussed how the HBCUs really do not teach and empower black society. How uh, what what do you two think are things that we can do as black people to start educating the youth and start educating each other to empower each other? Because we can't rely on HBCUs and colleges and universities to it, teach it, us it, the truth. Even at the height of the movement of black power, people had study groups. I mean, find people that like reading. Mm. And we also need to, one thing we need to do, we need to make being a dumb, semi-literate person uncool, okay? Half of the black men here in DC either cannot read or struggle to read. Uh, a black man who can't read needs to be rejected. We need, what they have done, black people, black men had a higher rate of literacy 54 years ago than what they do now we're going backwards we can't we don't read they took phonics out of school they did a range of that you need to surround yourself with people that read form reading groups study groups um you need to invest in that and 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 meet and discuss books yeah. discussions you know Dr. that Short, would be tremendous let me, let and as it. well as historic and accurate films you need to make infotainment where your what delights you should be learning knowledge books and enlightening the mind what we have now as a culture like the shitty music that y'all listen to bad music bad food bad pastimes you've got um what's her name that trifling disgusting megan the stallion who has the ugliest nipples of all times it looks like a dog barfed up its own poo poo well, she needs to cover those far. damn things i, I would there. i would <laughs> cover those good damn good things up guy, girl guy. i shouldn't know what your nipple look like i don't buy your records anyhow <laughs> we need to get rid of the stupid ignorant pursuits we need to destroy the culture of black stupidity Keeping it real doesn't mean going through life being dumb fucked, bombed out, drugged out black folks. Dr. That's Dr. that's keeping it real if you want to be a goddamn slave yeah, or Dr. genocide. Yeah, I, taught, I, taught in, I taught Chicago public schools. I taught for 46 years. I also taught at St. Xavier University and Governor State. Mm -hmm. But do you know I retired in 2016? And do you know for the last for the from, from 2016 to 2000 to about 2006, they wouldn't even let us teach the kids spelling. Mm. They stopped teaching kids how to spell. That's because they deliberately wanted black people not to know shit. See, everybody know you got to learn how to spell. When I was teaching high school, I taught high school. I taught at Carver. I taught at CVS. And you know, my father had a fourth grade education from Mississippi. And I'm sad to say my father with his fourth grade education could read better than the seniors that I was teaching. Yeah. And that's, I've seen sure. this in the schools as well. People have to read. And something else I'm going to tell you, we've got plenty of educated people, Black American people, something positive. We're among the most educated people in the world, although you wouldn't know it because of what's presented. We have more people with degrees than people in Germany or for that matter, Russia. But you know what? We have a culture. I'll give an example. When I was a student at Harvard, 
you know, I would have probably been seen as corny. We would walk the sisters home at night so nobody would attack them. The guys that were smart, that were black, the white women, the white men, everybody wanted the black men that were smart except for the black females. We have a fucked up sex mating culture. Mm. And so one of the most powerful things that drives men is sex. You sisters need to stop celebrating the dumb fuck derelict niggas and start picking the smart ones. Because the white women pick the best of black men. But you know, but, but, the but Asians, it's... everybody does that. And black men, too, need to not be afraid of a sister that cracks open a book. I'm going to just tell you this story. I remember I would invite people to visit my, my, my apartment when I stayed on campus at Howard. And I noticed when people would get to my room, I had bookshelves all along the walls. People would have nervous breakdowns at my book collection. And I would notice people would come in and people were very chatty until they saw the books and then they would panic. And they were frightened by the books, like the books are going to scare them. So you know what I did? I put up a picture of the chronic that had the marijuana leaf and Biggie. And I put some stupid shit up there so I wouldn't alienate a lot of niggas in college are the dumbest shit because being dumb, they think being stupid is being black yeah. when that's not true. And at they all. have sold not to our all. people being a dumbass black person is being real. And the black person that can read, the black person that can think they're acting white. Your yeah. generation must have an intellectual and spiritual revolution against the moral rot that's taken over our community that the boule the church and white society has pushed on us to exterminate us. But you know, Doctor Doctor Short, Randy. You know, it's it's very difficult because see, a lot of a lot of it's hard to talk to a sister unless you got boldness. When I was in when I was in high school, you know, I watched I studied the ugly guys. The ugly guys had the prettiest girls, and you know why the ugly guys had the prettiest girls? Because they would just step up and talk to them. But see, a lot of brothers, a lot of young men, people today, a lot of young men today, because of the fact that they went through high school and the girls referred to them as nerdy or the girls wouldn't talk to them, a lot of them don't know how to talk to girls, Randy. Dr. Shaw, a lot of them don't know how to talk to girls. They, they, don't, they don't know that, that talking to a woman is just conversation. They think you got to have some type of secret words, some type of secret code. How do, how do, how, how do, we, how do we get young black men to be brave well, what we, we need to we need to have what I would call um, and we used to do this. I set it up when I was a student at Harvard where we would have um, we just have socials and it wasn't about anybody having sex or slobbering somebody down, but just coming together, having a meal and just meeting and greeting. And, and not a lot of loud music. We do a lot of antisocial stuff. The old school people would meet. Maybe you have a little dance, but you just talk. Like you said, people need to to communicate. A lot of folks, basically a cell phone is almost like a male's vibrator. They got phone in their hand, everything, but knowing how to talk to the next person. Yeah. Don't let the technology of your enemy come between your ability to communicate with fellow human beings. Yes. I want to ask... Um, a couple more questions because you know we've been on for um a while and i don't want to take up these brothers times i know they have things well we can i mean to me i can do till yeah, i think i can su <laughs> i can survive till 11. Can. we'll stop at 11 or before okay well okay well let me ask the question because um somebody had mentioned this in the comment section they had mentioned like book clubs and you know study groups and things like that so my question to you both is if someone who is kind of just like brand new to black history and black empowerment if they wanted to study or get together with a group of people and study to really get the foundation and their knowledge together so they can really start building themselves what would be like two or three books that you guys would recommend are good starter books for people to really get to learn themselves and learn their black history. Um, here's my suggestion. They have Dr. Winters. I gave you 30 of Dr. Winters titles. Yeah. That's one. That's just a, I mean, basically 
I I just, you know, I had to work a whole week and just buy all the Dr. Winner's books because I've been miseducated. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I've been miseducated and I've been trying to find the truth my whole life. But um, people have my email. They have Dr. Winter's email. Um, I don't want to just throw out any topic of a book, but I'd like to think for a few minutes about books. Uh, what would be best? I wouldn't recommend just two or three. But, you know, if if you give, for example, if I give you a text like from slavery to freedom, that's going to be insufficient. Do you get where I'm coming from? Yeah. So you need to tell that person who asked for two or three. They don't realize that I understand they're being humble, but that's crazy as shit to try to give you just two or three because of the complexity of our situation. Mm. What I would recommend is that maybe we think about maybe 10 books because it's it's that that's it, there's no way to put it all in two or three books yeah. i know people in fact uh that person that wrote the question isn't it but i know and dr winners i think i i told you a, a person says oh, give me your bibliography yeah. and um that's the stupid the stupidest most disrespectful question to ask someone because that's like saying you know how big is your dick Certain things are proprietary that you don't share with other people. But here's where I'm going with this. What we can do is recommend a few books as a point of departure for you to spend the rest of your life reading. And because I don't want to tell you how to think or what to think about. So I can give you some things and I then would advise you to find a bookstore once you've gotten some titles and then look at what's there because you may want to look more towards black women in history. Or you may want to look towards um, history of science. You may want to look more towards the diaspora. I don't want to tell someone how to look because this is a thing for your mind and your development. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is that you must start thinking. And if you're really serious about knowledge, you won't make it with two or three books. You need to be thinking about maybe a good 50 or 100. Am I lying, Dr. Winters? Because you'll find it's very difficult to fit. I don't want to shortchange you, pick two or three titles. And I, someone would jump down my throat if I mentioned they came before the Mayflower and I didn't mention race, rebellion, and reform. And I did, I mean, there's so much that you didn't do. So, what would make more sense? is for Dr. Winters and I, or for us to sit down and look at, you've got our email, to write some of, write us, take the time, take us seriously, and send us an email. Hey, Dr. Shortwood, I'm, this is sort of what I'm interested in. This is what I think I'd like to know. And then sit down and look at something and make some recommendations for you. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. And that, that's easier than two or three books because that's like trauma traumatic to try to figure out how not to screw you by see, giving you too much of one thing and not enough of another. And see, and, and plus, you know, I used to I used to teach educational psychology at a uh, Governor State University. When when I taught educational psychology, I had to always go back and I had to teach the students about the Greco Romans and their philosophers and all that type of stuff. So, so I believe I believe that that if that if you're going to get a grounding, a grounding in our history and culture, you have to go back and read some of the books written by E. Franklin Frazier about the black middle class. You black bourgeoisie. You, you have to read, uh, you know, uh, uh, Manon's book on black skin, white man, and Richard of the Earth, and, and those Richard. guys. And, and they may not be history books per se. This is why we're talking about Harold Cruz and others. And you got to get and, the and, in order to have a framework to better understand the history yeah. is to have some intellectual tools. Yeah. Otherwise, a lot of people think history is simply learning facts, dates, and personalities, and that's not it at all. You know, and I was trying to, I was trying to develop a course on black education. And so I, I went and I, I looked at all these books written by black, by black authors today. And many of these black authors today, they don't know about our cultural roots. They don't know about how we learn. They don't know about how, how black people 
our masses. See, remember, this is it. You have a memory that goes back at least 200,000 years. You have a memory that goes back at least 2,000, 200,000 years. Therefore, when the European tells you that black children cannot learn, when they tell you that you can't learn, that is just, in a sense, what's called, you know, they're trying to make you feel inferior. Because, see, that's why black people that came out of slavery, they never went to school and they learned how to read. See, we get ourselves from the, the Akashic Records. You see, you can do whatever you wish. You can do whatever you wish. The only thing is, is that you have to believe in yourself. And you need to get a black woman as a black man. The only reason that you have to get a black woman as a black man is this, is that a black woman is an amulet. An amulet. She's a talisman. You know, I was married to my wife for 50 years. We were friends for 52 years. I noticed, I noticed when I was married to my wife that anything I wanted in this world, if she wanted me to have it, I got it. You see? And see, look, right now you can right now you can you can go to Google and Google Google slave rebellions, Google slavery, and you're gonna find that 95% of those pictures are pictures of black women getting their asses beat by white men, by drivers. You know why? Because see, they want to keep you from that power. They want to keep you from that temple. See, we don't we don't call a black woman a goddess just for the hell of it. We don't call her a queen just for the hell of it. The white man knows the power. And that's why right tonight, right after you get off here, go look at TV, look at any commercial. Every commercial now got a white man with a black woman. Why? Because they want to get that energy. They want to take away our power. They want you to be lost. They want you to be all alone, you see? And that's why they had to give our women feminism. And that's why they became pork yeah. chop feminists. Yeah, it's awful. Pork chop feminism, it's a curse. Mm -hmm. And so what I would suggest to you, at Brother Afro Elite, um, I had a book club and it was fun. And uh, YouTube knocked my book club out, but I'm thinking, we should have book clubs. In fact, that brother that does, uh, what is it, the Afro Nerd, we should have a book club. I, I'd be open to that. I would be open to that, but I'd like to do it on my channel as well. I want to have some of the content so I can populate it. So Absolutely. I'm thinking we can when, work. When are you going to start your own channel? Um, you know, I'm thinking to. I could do it this month. I was thinking to pick a day and just do books and maybe do chapters of different things because it's now, worthwhile. That'll, that'll be safe. You won't get in trouble. <laughs> Say that again? That'll be safe. You won't get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can do books. And also, I know people that send me PDFs, which means if we get an, an email for a list or an idea, one can send you links or send you articles to things that you might find interesting. Uh, the white supremacists do this on Reddit. Yeah. Um, they don't do that on Griot, the, but we need to make learning and sharing, exchanging. Right. Like we post articles, we can do this around that. I'm open to that. Um, I'm just so pleased with Brother Afro Elite you are you're like you're 40 years old and yet you're in your 20s. I can't imagine where you'll be in 30 years or 20 years or 10 years. So thank you. That's why I went and got Dr. Winners and said, Dr. Winners, we need we've got to help. We've got to bring along the young folks that have not let all this stuff destroy them. So I I know a couple. And what I want to recommend is to form a book club. It's informal. Don't have to join so the FBI and people don't bother you. <laughs> and um, also, we need to have a we need to have an informal uh, black knowledge or black a, a black knowledge and a black power mini conference, and we could do that via Zoom, yeah. and um, and and do that periodically. I'm open to that. Uh, the best the best day for me is Sunday because you know that's not really God's day. I'm a Sabbatarian. I do my stuff on Saturday, the Sabbath. So I'm not one of those fake people that say I know God, but yet I don't get the damn day right to celebrate them. Yeah. So Sundays are good for me. 
Yes. Now, of course, as for I'm letting the audience know, I'm going to be in contact with uh, Dr. Short. So whenever we get all the details about that set up, I will let you guys know. So you guys definitely need to subscribe. If you haven't done so, subscribe so you guys can stay up to date on that information. But mm -hmm. let me ask you, uh, Dr. Short. So you said you, you're planning on doing it this month. I have like been promising people. I've been wanting to do it. And this, if it this wasn't. Is a, this is an Afro. Afro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give Dr. Short a day and ask him, can he, can he do begin the book club here once a month? Yeah, we can do that. We well, can and, do that. And, and, and I can, I can do that with you. And, uh, when we want to do something, I have another thing. So I wouldn't mind doing that. I mean, I could do that with you. That would be cool. Plus, uh, I know if I have a channel, they're going to take that shit no matter what I do. No, if I go up not. and say, no, and, no, if no, I say not. I love white people, they'll shut no, it off. No, no, no. <laughs> this time, Dr. Short, this time, Dr. Short, you're going to keep it clean. You're going to talk about books. No, I was it. talking about books. That's that's what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but but, the, but you, you're going to cut out some of the dirty jokes. No, it wasn't no. the dirty. It wasn't the dirty jokes. I called it the Angry Black Men's Book Club. They didn't like the name. Oh wow! The mm, name yeah. was bothering the Angry Black Men is making some you know person. They're radical. I mean, so they had problems with that. Yeah, so you know. You know uh, you, when did they shut your your channel down? Oh, it's been like a year and a half. They they and they did another one too. Every time I have a channel, they shut it down. Yeah. Well, um, uh, and they took my Twitter down because I asked whether Obama would support pedophilia. Mm -hmm. I did a poll, and like ninety percent of people, ninety five percent of the people said that Obama supported pedophilia. They didn't like the polls. I was asking, no, uh, so they just uh, took. They didn't tell me why they took the chat that my Twitter page. They just took it. No discussion. It's gone. Yeah. Well, anybody, anybody that's interested in black history, you can go to YouTube, look under Clyde Winters. I got over 240 uh, videos on various aspects of black history. I got about seven websites. Just put in, in Google Clyde Winters and I'll pop up. That'll be the only nigga you see. And uh, and the thing is, this is that tomorrow, tomorrow I'll be on, uh, I'm on Reverend uh, Shock Matthews uh, platform. We talk every Thursday. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about the uh, the Arab lie, the lie that the Arabs began the slave trade, and uh, you guys can kind of uh, listen to that tomorrow. So, uh, oh, I want to hear that. Uh, so, who started the slave trade? Who started the Portuguese? <laughs> oh, okay, I, I got, I got you. But I got a, I got a, I, I you. Uh, I wasn't supposed to. I got to build it up. Oh yeah, you, you, you spoiled it. You spoiled, it. spoiled, it. but. People are still good. That's that's like a little sneak peek. Don't don't yeah. don't trip on that. That's okay. a little sneak so, peek. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you have further questions? Uh, uh yes, yes. Um my question was circling circling back to the American Maroon film in the American Maroon documentary. Uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people are are saying that they didn't know about they they knew about like the civil war and one of the things that they really enjoyed was the aspect of the fact that they didn't realize how the union was losing until black people joined them and i remember you guys stated yeah. that robert e lee wanted to surrender the second he, like negroes ah, uh, nah we cool with that and he almost wanted to surrender but one thing i've been talking about for years is how the union were very, very anti-black. The union were very racist. They were not They're friends racist of black white people. people. What did you expect? Yeah. So, um, can and you, and you got to remember is that that most of the opposition came from immigrants. The Irish in New York, yeah, the Italians and Germans in Philadelphia. You know, they they remember that they they deserted. You know, and the they rioted and they murdered people. Right. And That's there true. were riots in Baltimore too. Mm. See, because because of the high desertion rate, and there were money. riots in Chicago. They had yeah. riots all over the country. They didn't want to die for black people. They saw black people as competition. They were brought here to replace us. That's right. See, oh, because yeah. Because see, you got to remember, uh, Afro, that we had all the trades. We were the tradesmen. We were the we were the, the steel workers. We were the ones who were who deal, dealt with the horses. We worked in the uh, we were the carpenters. 
We were the, we were the cowboys. We were the brick everything. masons. We were the stone cutters. We were the iron workers. Right. You, you name it. They didn't bring, look. Uh, anyway, so I hope we answered that question anymore. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. This question comes from uh, somebody in the audience, Jeffrey Hall. He asks, Dr. Winters, why does so uh, so black immigrants, uh, so many, I'm assuming, so many black Im immigrants harbor so much contempt for FBA? <laughs> well, they, they harbor, I'm, I'll try to explain to you. Just like when I was talking about talking to Afro Elite, and I, and, I, and I reminded Afro Elite that his mom and dad made him have to go fight. They didn't go say kill nobody, but it, but they didn't. They wanted you to fight even if you lost the fight. And yeah. see, black foundational black Americans have, have always fought all our lives. We 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 fight for freedom even when we know we're gonna lose. We still fight. Okay, but then people immigrants they fled their countries. They came over here and they they bend the knee. You will not hardly find an FBA. You mean they lower the jaw. At that, well, that, that's all. That's only for those brothers who uh. Well, you know who go that way. Well, what about Kamala? She lowers her jaw. Well, well, well she was. She, I bet you that mandible joint is probably so loose that, on that her. Does, that doesn't matter, Kamala. <laughs> Kamala in her day, she was a fine woman. And if I'd have been going to Howard, I would have. Oh, no, I wouldn't have had no sex with. <laughs> okay, but anyway, but go back. Back to your point. Back to your point. Well, so the point is this: is that FBAs have been taught to fight because FBAs have a fight in us. We don't even know when to stop fighting. We don't know. We don't know when to give up. You see, look, look at what they've done to, done to Doctor Short. They took away his jobs. They, 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 they've done everything to harass him. They took away his, his YouTube, and yet here's this man still fighting, still fighting, still leading. And see, this is what immigrants can't stand. They can't stand that fight in us. They don't understand how can you fight when you're going to lose. How can you fight the white man? Because he's our they, white man is their god. And he so is their god. Take. They can't take it. That's why. That's why immigrants hate FBA because we fight. And, see, and they, they came they, here. They you know, came here to, to to kiss the white man's ass. Yeah. And nobody's going to dissuade them of not doing it. That's right, but see, but if it, it was one thing, most of us didn't notice it. We got it. We got to come back to Tariq Nasheed. Most of us did not notice it until Tariq Nasheed started showing us all those videos because we didn't know that immigrants hated us so much. You know, my wife knew it because I was in, when I was, a, I was at Iowa State University, director of the Black Cultural Center, and my wife met some, met some African ladies and she said, Oh, you, 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 you black Americans, you got it good. You don't know how to, you got a washing machine, you got it. She said, Well, kiss my ass, bitch. But hey. <laughs> But see, that's the whole point. You got fighting you, Afro. The other brother, you got fighting you. They don't understand. They don't understand why do you fight? And see, but they also they also see us as losers that should accept our fate. Ah, good point. And that's they see us as losers that should accept our fate. And and they also get an incentive. White people reward them for being against us. Right. Look, look okay, at now, but, but let me tell you, uh, it comes back to haunt people. If you go to places like Oregon and Washington, a lot of these immigrants, even the black ones, are on meth and drugs because their kids realize their parents lied to them. And so uh, you want to see a high rate of divorce? Look at African families. You want to see kids on dope? And getting in trouble and joining gangs, a lot of these kids, second generation by third generation, these folks are basically, uh, they actually perk up, pick up the worst traits and foundational black American folks who are low lives because they can't agree with the uh, rose lens colored vision of their parents about what America is. Mm. In a way, true, but I, I noticed that I, uh, when I, when I was, uh, after my retirement, between 2019 and 2021, I uh, taught in the suburbs, you know. So I taught, I taught some immigrant kids. And, uh, and those immigrant kids, they would act like they were terrified of black, of black, of black kids. And they act like they were terrified of black teachers. <laughs> it's crazy. But the point is this, is that 
I, I think, like you said, is that they don't understand why we supposed to have lost, and they heard we lost, and then they come over here and they see us steadily fighting for justice. And see, that's because the fact is that, like Neely Fuller said, we're prisoners of war. If you're a prisoner of war, you can never, ever really feel comfortable. I hate no, Neely Fuller. And, and, and there's something else. They see that the other people hate us, and they see right now, black folks, let's be honest, to, to, we're at the lowest state that I've ever seen us yeah. on all levels. So they see us at our worst. It's sort of like if you saw a person on crack, on piss and shit, you don't know what they really used to be. You just see what they are right now. Right. Mm. And you don't understand how they got there. You just see them there. It's like the Somali guy who wrote about being an American. He went back to Somalia. He was talking about how he was taught to hate black Americans. He realized the black Americans were the only decent people he knew in America. And he didn't want to be here anymore. And he understood why black Americans were like they were and why he admired us, but not the other Americans. And he left. They see us and black folks need to admit we've fallen off the wagon. A lot of us, we've become very pathetic and sorry. When you see the videos of folk fighting and everybody's overweight and tattoos on your eyeballs and shit like this. What what this uh, dick hop culture with all the other things has made us a parody. If you had been a boy, a little boy like I was, I remember being a little boy, three, four years old, and you could see how black women used to look on average when they left the house. You know what I'm talking about, Winters. Yeah. It's just... Nowadays, people with the bonnets and all this shit on, this is like going from Miss, uh, a Miss Universe contest to um, a, a thriller remake video. Yeah. Well, and you think, you think and, I mean, it's really ugly. I mean, black was beautiful. Now it's shitty. It's see, but, ugly now. It's despicable. And that's not how I feel about my people. But see, they've set it up. They've rigged and manipulated this culture. It's called hegemony. There's a hegemony of degeneracy that fits within Negro empiricism and white supremacy that has the necessary outcome that you see. We're not really seeing ourselves. We're acting out the negative images in the minds of people that hate us by us not knowing how we're being literally conditioned to be less than who we are. And that's why they took history out of the schools. Look at this. Look at this. Yes, you yes, I can, yeah, that's true. My generation, we said black power. Black is beautiful, you see? But look at what they did. You cannot find black Moors, black Hebrews, Aboriginal black people. None of them want to be called black. But we mm. said black was beautiful. But that's just to show how, how, how the white man created in us an amnesia. He created in us, in a sense, a loss of identity. That's why I talk about caves. Culturally acquired immune identity. And, and there's something else. They made money and, and degenerate sex and a range oh. of other things the goal. Yeah. That, that you know, I knew guys, these guys, they were sleeping with ladies, but they would they were like brothers and sisters. It wasn't like it is now, which is totally disrespect for one another. This was not who we were. Even the music used to be love songs. Now, a lot of the stuff is hate and disrespect. And uh, we have to regain our souls. Right. That's why, yes, I said it. I talk about God. We've lost God. We need to get him back. Right. And witchcraft and all this other bullshit that folk are doing, the more I see people do this dumb pagan crystals. shit, it crystals. doesn't work. Our crystals. Oh, God, yes. Uh, prisons have faggotized and destroyed us. And um, and they've made prison cool to cover up for the fact that someone's booty got taken. I've had people say men don't have sex in prison. Bullshit. Oh, I got, well, this is it. I knew God existed because many a damn night I was on 47th Street. Many a night I had to run from 51st Street to 49th Street. I saw many a bullet fly past my damn head. 
disciple Blackstone Ranger shooting at me, and I was a neutron. I was a neutron. But see, back in the day when I was growing up, if to, to become a disciple or to become a, a Blackstone Ranger, you had to kill somebody. And so mm -hmm. they would come and shoot the neutrons. And so, but the thing is this, that I learned that God was my savior. I learned that God, I didn't, I'm sorry, I, I didn't go, I didn't go to black or white Jesus. I had to go to God. Because when I saw them bullets whizzing past my head in 1967, and I saw my life come before me, and my friend next to me was shot in the back, bleeding and shit, I said, hey, only God, Amma, only God, Amma, will save my ass. And I hear brothers today, I hear old brothers, young brothers, say they don't believe in God. Do you really think, do you really think we would be here? What is critical race theory? Critical race theory is that the white man hates you. Number two, critical race theory states that no matter what you do, you will never get rights in this country. And number three, the white man has created a race in which you're running, but it's a race that you can never win because he set it up so you will lose. But even though he set it up so we can lose, even though he hates us, even though he wants to kill us because of God, we still stand strong because of God. We got a man like Dr. Short to come out here and tell the truth to the people. We not, might not want to hear it. We might not want to believe it. And he, he going to add a joke or two. But this is a man because of God who's here to lead us to the promised land. And what is the promised land as a black man? When I was a teenager, I wanted to meet some P.U.S. That's why my son told me that since I got a Ph.D., I shouldn't say put. So I can just say P.U.S. That's why. Yeah, and they, and they they put that together. I want to ask. You, this. But let me finish. Okay. When you're a man and you get well, older, he put it together too. Yeah. When you get older, though, <laughs> when you get older though. P.U.S. That's why doesn't mean nothing to you. When you get older, your whole world evolves around a job, and that's how the white man always attacks us. He wants to keep our asses out of work because he knows in a sense that your self-respect of yourself and your woman comes from a job. That's mm. all I got to say. Go ahead. The next Thank question. You. Now, this question, I've, and I say I deliberately saved this question for last because I felt like this was going to be, at least for me, the most powerful question. A spoiler for all of the people who have not watched the American Maroon movie. If you haven't, I put the link to the website so you can buy it in the dvd also you can go to fb stream and you can stream it so if you haven't watched it but this spoiler now there was um a lot of righteous honorable warrior spirit in the maroons which helped them empowered them and guided them into fighting back against white supremacy and their oppressors and a lot of that same heart exists within us today is uh the the same fighting spirit the same courage and the bravery exists in us today now a lot of people are saying because of how long we've been oppressed and how um bad the situation is a lot of people are saying that we're fighting a losing battle we're fighting for reparations and we're never going to get reparations we're just fighting an uphill battle that will never win mm -hmm. let me ask you two brothers do you guys do in your opinion especially considering the fact that we're making a, a progress when it comes to reparations do you guys feel that we are fighting a losing battle or do you guys feel like eventually we will overcome the system of white supremacy can i go first yeah, absolutely I don't really think that um, enough of us are fighting. They've gotten a lot of us to punk and chump ourselves out of the fight. That's the main thing going on, is that too many people ride the fence. Um, in fact, um, in the military, there's a whole thing called defeatism, where uh, you act like you're defeated and you behave. Do you realize in the military, in the army code, if you're a defeatist person, the conflict, they can take you up against the wall and shoot you for not thinking that your side can win. Oh, wow. And the black community, when a person says blacks can't get reparations, we can't stand, we can't read, we can't write, we can't have a family, no black man shit, this defeatism. In other communities, people would persecute you, punish you, maybe kill you for not standing by your own. 
we have to have a code where uh, you cannot say, like, we need to do this around reparations. I, my term is an anti-reparationist, an anti-rep. If a person's against reparations, that they should be looked down on like a person walk around with the ball of doo-doo on their forehead. We have to uh, punish people who are defeatists. It shouldn't be tolerated. The same way if you stink and you have body odor, people let you know that you stink. We have a lot of things that we reject and ostracize people for in the black community, but it's never around things that are necessary for social cohesion and mobilization to fight for our ultimate goal, which is liberation from oppression. So we're not really fighting. You know, I'll give you an example from military. It's uh, 224 and 227. These are both orders issued by Generalissimo uh, Yusef Dugashvili, a.k.a. Joseph Stalin. The Germans, uh, when they came into Russia in uh, June of 1941, a lot of the Russian soldiers weren't trying to fight that hard. They were surrendering. And what Stalin did was he ordered, uh, issued Order 224, which means if you were in the Russian army and you surrendered, and you didn't fight to the death, they would pick your family up. They'd kick your wife's ass because you stopped fighting. Oh, wow. And after that, they came up with 227. 227 is with, when you're facing the enemy, you can't retreat. If you retreat, they'll shoot you dead on the spot. You must go forward and engage the enemy. What you need to understand is what many black people consider success and achievement is uh, running from the truth, running from the enemy, not fighting. That's black success, being a coon. We have to come up with our policy where we punish treason, traitors, and defeatism. Because if a person knew, if I'm an HR black woman, because I've encountered them, and they give jobs to everybody but black men, that if she were going to get punished, but people could figure out that she never gave a black man a job, she'd think twice about discriminating against every black man that applied. Vice versa, a black man that won't stand up gets punished. We need a system of coercion and enforcement of a code that we're not going to take this shit anymore. And we don't care who we have to step to to stop it. You know, under black power, the pimps... And the pushers didn't do certain things because the black power people would beat their asses. Mm. This, this, this crack and shit came after black power. It wouldn't have been tolerated by the boomers that were activists. But what it is it's, that they, they, there is a whole point. They, they were able in a sense to push people down. See, see black, white people have taught you a lot. White people have taught you. That, that, it, that it will take total unity of black people to get success. Mm. I believe that we will get reparations. And the reason we're gonna get reparations because see, all you need is a cadre of people who are gonna demand it. And it's that, it's that unified group of people that's going to get things done. That's I'm exactly saying, right. We don't I'm need saying, everybody. That's and my I'm, motto is only a fly wants to be unified with shit. That's right. The black folks that aren't about anything, we don't need. They're already dead to us. It. We don't need it, but and we but don't need to outnumber anybody 10 to 1. Look at Africa, where right. the Africans outnumber the white folks and still don't run their own country. Don't we don't need everybody. We need the committed people. And, look, and we look. need folks who are not defeatist. We need folks that don't worship other folks. We need folks that care about their own community right. to defend it at all costs. If we get a critical mass of that, there's nothing they can do about it. In fact, to this day, one of my ancestors, you've heard of him, his name is Nat Turner. Nat Turner never had more than 50 people. It's almost 200 years later, and they they want to pretend the man never existed. They, still, they, 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 they can't even deal with anyone black even having stood up ever, almost 200 years later, this is how weak they are. Yeah. And that's why they had the slave code where you couldn't get more than two or three black men together because they understand just a little bit of unity is too much. And that gets back to my point. Black men in particular have got to stop being their own worst enemies. Right. Murdering, killing, raping, fornicating. 
cheating, taking the man's woman. We've got to have an agreement of those who are going to be part of the change that I'm going to give a damn. I'm going to have at least a kind of agape love, respect for those who are in this struggle that are colleagues, that are cadres, that no FBI, no NSA, no CIA, no Homeland Security could send me a letter and say, whole Afro elite said your mother's a bitch. And then I come and shoot you (laughs) without saying, hey, brother, you know, I got this letter saying this crazy shit about you. I don't believe it. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. This is how they took the Panthers down because the Panthers had some good things, but certain things they did not have. They didn't have the enough discipline, love, and respect for each other where someone could just come in. Or one person, just one pussy, Elaine Brown, one pussy almost destroyed the Black Panther Party. That's real talk. And everybody celebrates the whole. Elaine Brown as a whole who was screwing the CIA, FBI, and the Panthers getting folk killed. We need discipline. And not, and we sexual, need discipline. sexual discipline, fiducial yeah. discipline, spiritual discipline, respect for self, love for one another. You only need a few people to need that. And see, and, and it's a shame today. When I was growing up, yeah, my father, my father, I lived in a building. It was about nine apartments. My father was the only, only father in the building. Everybody mm-hmm. else had everybody else had had single moms, but those 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 guys grew up to be men. You knew how, why they grew up to be men, because the sisters, because see the baby mamas, they they uncles, they brothers, they elders, their fathers. They taught the guys how to grow up, the children how to grow up as men. We don't have enough men trying to teach men boys to be men. Mm, Boys yeah. to be men. I got five sons and one daughter. I told my sons, I said, I'll love you till the day you die. But I said, I don't want to just love you. I want to respect you as a man. And the only way I can respect you as a man is if you take care of your families and you be strong. And and luckily I can respect all my sons because they do that. But see, that's what a man needs to teach a boy. But you don't have to have, just because it's a baby mama, uncles, come on, help out your nephew. Yes, Be sir. that nephew. And so, yeah, we, we need brotherly solidarity. Right. And, and, and it needs to happen quick, fast, in a hurry. Right. And understand something. When they put the, took the men out of the family, they put people in jail. They're deliberately driving things that increase the chances that people will be same sex activated and attracted, not so much over sex, but because of the deprivation of not having a father, not having a grandfather, not having an uncle, not having those things. It's a lack. And so now folk are afraid of each other or they're staring at each other's asses like it's a pop tart. We we need to have that and by the way that's going to take some god because the society is sex drenched even the hip-hop music where the people look hard are punks promoting all kinds of nasty stuff and trannies everywhere something must happen and yes i'll tell folks prayer intervention we need to pray for a spiritual cultural moral ethical revival amongst those who are the remnant that are going to take this football of black freedom across the end zone and get us our reparations and liberation. Somebody say, I say, so we got 12 minutes to 11 questions. Okay. Um, well, you guys have given, I put, so the audience knows I put a lot of you guys information in the description. Uh, I said, we can't edit it during the live after live. I'm a, you know, see if there's any more information I can put there. But where can people find both of you guys? And are there any upcoming projects that you guys would like to announce to the audience? Uh, sure. Well, there's going to be a TV show at some point called the, the Short Report. We're working on that. There is a thing being done by uh, Chef C called From the Soil. The first episode, I think I sent it to you. Um. 
of course, I do, I'm going to be doing more stuff with Dr. Winters. There's a thing called uh, Diaspora Global, where I'll be doing conversation with a brother over in the UK. And I'm hoping uh, to do some stuff. I mean, I'll do this book thing with you. That'll be cool. Oh, yeah. um, folk can find me. I, I, it's You put Randy Short in Google, you can find me. That's why I cussed the first time I've been trying to find you. I told you a lying African. You Google me, you'd find me. There's all kinds of ways to find me, okay, if you really want to. And um, I don't necessarily want to talk to folks over the phone unless, you know, it's a good conversation. But people can email me. It's very easy. Um, and there are other things that are going to come up. I have uh, something called the People's Report. I hope it launches this month. And also... Um, uh, say a prayer for me. I am the owner of Black Agenda Report, Dr. Uh, Clyde Winters. Mm -hmm. I have to just decide what am I going to do because these folks are, um, they're folks publishing and printing stuff, but I own the corporate name. You know, that's unlawful. I haven't uh, made up my mind, but at some point, oh, don't I might. Sue yet. Don't sue them yet. Wait till they made more money. Um, <laughs> so I'm just, there, there are all kinds of things that could happen. I know that there's a documentary uh, that may come out on Roger Stone, and you know there are other things coming. So there are all kinds of things happening. Uh, and let Dr. Wanna speak. I, I'm done. If they okay, want me, you can find me. You can uh, find me uh, every Thursday. I, I'm on uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Reverend Shock Matthews' uh, website. Uh, every Thursday, uh, we have an, uh, we have a conversation. And I talk about uh, history. I talk about our history. I talk about Aboriginal history, uh, world history. I talk about history every week. So you can find me there. Uh, as I said before, you uh, you can uh, go to my uh, YouTube page. I have uh, over 240. I really had 280, but then he had some of them. I got 240 uh, videos on all aspects of history. Uh, I got 40 books. You can order my books from Amazon.com. Yes, sir. Let's go to Amazon.com, put in Clyde Winters, say Clyde Winters books. Uh, you can support me by buying any any of my 40 books. I'm working on 41. But uh, the thing is this, is that you can support me there. What, what I want you to understand is this, is that, you know, I'm 72 years old, so I got one foot in the grave. But the point is this, is that here you got Afro Elite, you got Randy Short. These guys are going to carry on the spirit, you see. They're going to carry on the spirit. And that's what is so important is that you have to understand that that it's, it's, it doesn't take two. It doesn't take three. All it takes is, is one. If you spread the message of reparations, if you spread the message, message that we're the Maroons, this is Maroonish right now. This is Maroonish because you've got men talking together. You've got men in a sense trying to share knowledge, trying to share wisdom, trying to share truth. Yes, the American Maroonage is right here at Afro Elite. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to um, I want to personally thank both of you for taking the time out to be here with us to discuss, you know, aspects of how important uh, our brother Tariq Nishi's film American Maroon is and how important films like that is in knowing the history of American Maroons really is for our people. So I sincerely want to thank every single uh, both of you. And I want to let every single last one of the audience members know that their information, a lot of their books, they do a lot of good work. Um, they have a lot of upcoming projects. Not only have they done great work and made many great sacrifices, they are continuing to put good work out and make more books and more documentaries and more films and more things. So these brothers are, these brothers truly have that FBA American Maroon spirit where they say they're not going to surrender. They're not going to quit. They're not going to stop As for every second that they breathe. They're going to continue to empower their people. So, and so I, are you, we, we, we applaud you as an exemplary young brother. Uh, I mean, 
the fact that you dislike coons as much as I do, it's an honor to be in your presence. You, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I hate coons. I hate cooning. I, I, I can't stand pork chop feminism, faggotness, simps. There's a lot of stuff to not like. So just to see somebody, doesn't it feel good, Doctor Winters, to see someone his age like uh, taking a bite out of out of coons? It's like God, this. Stuff make yeah. me want to throw a Molotov cocktail. Just but I, but watch I, them. But I make like me feel kind of violent. I like the fact that he's smart enough to let some old geezers talk ish. And he yeah. can just be the moderator. But, but he does good by himself. He just, so I mean, okay. he, was on, he was up on Instagram, made me so angry. I said, I know him. I got to call him up and say, I mean, you, you sound as crazy as I do. I need to like, talk to you. Well, we don't we. We don't want him. We 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 need him to, to to be able to carry on this program. So he right. has to be the moderator. Let let other people talk ish. Yes. See, it's, right. it's, it's always got to come from somebody else. Cause you're young. You got a long way to go. I, I'll praise on the God. I got a picture from Chicago Board of Education. You see, and plus, and so then the thing is this is that you always have to have multiple streams of income. Multiple streams of income, but the point is this: is that you don't want them to to kill you, right? Because they can they can, they can kill you without even laying a hand on you. That's correct. See? They can kill you financially, right? And uh, if you've ever heard the story of Canada Lee, the actor who spoke up, they destroyed him. There yeah. were lots of stories. Paul Robeson, they destroyed him. People that spoke up. If they don't take your body, they attack that income. If you ever look at the civil rights movement, the way that they kept people from voting is if anyone voted, they got kicked out of the terrible sharecropping job. So basically, you could continue to be a slave as long as you didn't vote. You if can, you didn't vote, you couldn't even be a slave. And you can be revolutionary, but it's always somebody else that said it. I repeat right. It's always somebody else that said it. You see, right. that's how you yeah. survive. And I'll tell you something. The reason that I'm not dead is I wasn't as crazy <laughs> at at 29 as I am at 58. <laughs> yeah. well, see, you need to at least get to 40. Uh, they they bump people off, but they really go after young people. Yeah. They really, they're more afraid. The younger you are as a black man or woman, that's the more, they're most angry with young men under the age of 35. Yeah. That's, well, that's, that's who they're targeting. I so was you, crazy. I was crazy. I wanted to burn his mother down. But, but, but that's you. But, he's got a different, a different right. situation that he's in. That's good. So they, alive, they, but I'm alive today. Only for one reason. I love I fell in love with my wife and I was crazy. I'm crazy about her. I miss her to death. But the point is this is that she said, she said, Clyde, I know you want to be an artist. See, a historian is an artist because we create works of art. But my but my wife said, Clyde, me and your me and your kids need some food and you got to go to work. I tell you, man, normally, normally, normally black scholars, real black scholars. They don't they don't live past 40. I mean past 50. Definitely not 60. Look at how many, look how they died. And even even uh even Dr. Ben when he died. You know, Tariq had to bury him. Yeah. You know, Frances Wilson when she died. Tariq had to bury, bury her. That's a bitch, man. I got insurance with my kids. I hope they pay to bury me. But anyway, the thing is so that was that. You have to, you have to, in a sense. My wife made me get a job, and because my wife made me get a job, I lived longer than I would have lived. But that's because I was in love, and I love the hell out of my wife, and I miss her. But see, the most important thing is this: is that I've written forty books. I had to do that research, but the only way I could do that research, like Doctor Shaw to tell you, to really do good research, you need fellowships, you need scholarships. You need grants. I had to pay. I had to pay. I had to spend my own damn money. Sometimes my kids didn't get enough food to eat, maybe. But my wife said, if that's what you want to do, do it. You know? So I had to spend my own money. Like you. You spent your own money. 
When you went to L.A., you spent your own money to go to L.A. to go to the museum. You you had to contribute to it yourself. But the only thing that gave you that survival experience was what? You see, was what? You had the nerve to do it. See, and that's the most important thing about being FBA. You have to have the nerve to want to stand on your own two foot, ten toes down, and be ready to do what you feel is best, what you feel is the future. Yes. Can only now, be by you. Yes. Now, there are some people I want to let the audience know. I know you guys have asked some questions, uh, but we've been on for close to three hours, and I was just on with Dr. Randy Short, like, for another hour. So. Five hours, that's fine for you. Yeah, so it's 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 been a long night. So what we'll do is we'll schedule another time where we can have these brothers on. So I'm yeah. going to just go back in this uh, the um, chat. I'm going to bookmark every single person's question that was not asked and that was not answered. So next time we have them on, you guys will be first in line to have your questions answered. Right. So please make sure you subscribe. But I have to respect the time of our brothers here. I have to respect their guests. I mean, our guests, because I'm – um, central time. Dr. Short is not even central time. So it's 11 o'clock where he is. He's just been gracious enough to lend us his time. And our brother, Dr. Winters has been gracious enough to lend us his time. So I don't want to be a rude host, it's but I will, I, I'm not ignoring any, anybody's questions at all. I don't want you guys to think that. <laughs> no, but also, also uh, Afro, what you had to do is this is that if if you and uh, if you and uh, Dr. Short can uh, decide on a book, maybe uh, maybe you can talk to Dr. Short. Y'all get a date, and then you you want to at least announce three weeks ahead of time about the book that 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 you guys are going to discuss. I may even join it too, mm -hmm. and uh, I want you to I want you to get a title of a book and at least give three weeks notice. We that need to do that Harold Cruz book, Rebellion and Revolution. That's a, that's the best thing. It's short enough. And it's so it's so good, and it's it's worthwhile. We can have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. So you guys work it out and set up a day. And and and, that, and it's an inexpensive book that people can get their hands on. And by the way, brother Afro Elite, I have a PDF of Rebellion and Revolution that a brother sent me, okay. so I can email that to you, and we all can have a damn digital copy of it, free of charge. Okay. I mean, okay. I, I treat I believe in treating people like they're white. Isn't God good? White Jesus just gave us free <laughs> electrical books. He just keeps looking out for us. Hey, I mean Dave, he's giving you he's giving you the keys, Dr. Short. <laughs> thank you. You're uh, welcome. Thank you for that. So uh, <laughs> that's so y'all know that's what's next. You know. Right. Um if you guys in the audience, you guys is a rebellion or revolution. You guys can and, go and, they, and, and they can either email me. I can send them a, a e digital copy, you know, and I'll send it to you Afro elite and I'll send it to Dr. Winners. It's, you know, uh, I think we're good. We're good. So it's two minutes after 11 and thank God my cat has decided it's got its back turned to me. It's gotten tired of me doing the live. Uh, so, uh, which is good, but you know, they didn't disrupt this. So yeah, peace to everybody. Buy Dr. Winner's books, send some super chat to Afro elite. And of course, um, I got my books. I got two of them in particular, this one, Cory Booker. We should do a little bit of this too. His okay. sorry ass. He's okay. no damn good. And we should do, we should do some of one of Dr. Winner's books, even if it's just a chapter. We'll, do it down. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll plan that down the road. Right now, okay. we'll get started with, with one of yours. We'll do Rebellion. Then we'll do Spartacus. And then we might do, uh, I, got a, I got a memoir. My memoir is uh, Pathfinder. We might okay. do Pathfinder. And you know what? I want Afro Elite to be in touch with Larry Pinkney. We need to do a Black Power and a Black Leadership thing. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and our goal is to get... We need to get everybody listening. Afro Elite, he needs 10,000 followers. All of you can take this show and send it to 100 people and ask them to subscribe. And this is something that we don't do for each other. I've noticed folks have a big platform. They don't try to help anyone else. 
build yeah. their platform up. Uh, just because my platform is not active doesn't mean I don't want your platform to do well, brother, uh, brother Afro Elite. Um, we have to do that. Uh, so I, I'm a man of my word on that. We're going to see if we can get this number to bump up. Let me stop here. May God bless and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. I'm Dr. Randy Short, pastor of the Salvation and Liber Liberation Temple Ministry, LLC, as well as co-founder of the Black American Constitutional Political Action Committee and the People's Report and the owner of the Black Agenda Report, even though it's been hijacked. Um, I thank everybody. I thank the great Dr. Clyde Winters, and I thank this inspirational young brother, Raising Hell, Spitting Fire. I, I, I wish I had had 100 students like him to teach versus the little hard-headed Negroes that couldn't even put their name on their test papers <laughs> who complained about getting Fs and they never came to class. So God bless you all. Wake up, people. And my word to all of you, MFM. We need that motherfucking money in capitalist America. Absolutely. MFM. All right. See ya. Take I'm care. out. All right. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Uh, Claude, thank you for being here with us, brother. Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you, put my name put my name there, too. Because, see, when they see Dr. Short and Dr. Winters, you'll get more views. I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to edit. I can't do it while we're live, but I'm yeah. going to, after we're done, I'm going to like redo the thumbnail and all that. Yeah. So I'm going to fix all of that up. Yeah, because see, and that's it. And see, get that regular book club going. That way you can get an identity. You want to get an identity as, mm -hmm. as, part, as part of your platform. You want to have an identity. Part of, you know, you can still keep up with the current events, but by having a book club, that gives you an identity. That's going to attract more people too. So that's it. You want the identity thing. You know. Okay, absolutely. Take care, man. Absolutely, and thank you for being here. Oh yeah, peace. Bye, right, peace. Well, there you guys have it. We had a packed house. It was absolutely phenomenal discussing uh, a lot of the important elements of our brother Tariq Nasheed's film American Maroon. Shout out to Dr. Randy Short. Shout out to Dr. Claude Winters. Um, they will be back. They will be back. We're I mean, as you guys just heard now, and there's a lot of stuff that you guys haven't heard, but we're going to be working on future book clubs. Um, so you guys need to get that book. Um, uh, rebellion. The book was um, Rebellion or Revolution. You guys got to get that book before we start. When we get the dates, I'm going to you know, have a conversation with Dr. Randy Short about the dates and everything like that later. So you guys stay tuned because I will announce that. So when we get all the dates and all the stuff set up, we will be setting that up. I will bring him back. We're going to be talking about fake black leadership. We're going to be answering some of the questions that wasn't uh, asked in this particular broadcast. It's a lot of great things in the foreseeable future. So please make sure that you guys stay tuned. Please make sure that you guys subscribe to the channel. You guys can also follow me on my various social media pages right here, which is at Afro Elite on Instagram and then at the Afro Elite on Twitter. Make sure you follow me on both those things. Also, you guys can send me an email. My merchandise link is in the description. All of these things are in the description. And if there's anything that's not in the description, it will be soon because I'm going to work on the description right after I close this live. I want to thank you guys. It's been a lot. It's been a long night, but you guys been here. That's showing y'all maroon spirit. So I salute every single last one of you brothers and sisters for being here. I'm going to get off here and you all have a blessed evening. Thank you very much. Be one salute to every single last one of you.